Bernston Planning Board. Um, we're also joined tonight by the Economic Development Committee. Uh, I am going to uh, ask Whitney, who is the chair of that committee, to call it to Before you do that, I think you need to indicate that this meeting is held. Oh yes, sorry. Uh, this meeting is being held both in person on and online uh, and is being recorded and broadcast live. Uh, thank you for that reminder. Uh, this meeting is being held both in person and virtually through Zoom, pursuant to Governor Baker extending the COVID-19 rules allowing public meetings to be conducted remotely so that board and committee members as well as members of the public can participate remotely. Uh, I have called the planning board meeting to order uh, and uh, recognizing we have a quorum present in the room. Uh, and uh, Whitney, would you like actually, why don't we hold on you calling the EDC to order because I have something that I'm hoping will be relatively quick that we can get out of the way first. Sure. So uh, is anybody here to comment on anything that is not on the agenda? Excellent. Uh, we don't have any minutes to review for tonight, so what we have is right. uh, a couple items of new business to get out of the way quickly. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, will you come up to the table, please? And uh, identify yourself to the record and let us know what you're asking for. All right, I'm Damon Schmidt. Uh, so I'm asking to uh, put up a greenhouse similar to the one that we just put up. Uh, the hoop house and also to I guess average the 5,000 gallons a day per week so I reached out to mr. Murray at places associates yep. uh, for the record and he suggested that the planning it would be appropriate for the planning board to look at these as minor changes uh, and that all we would need to do in the situation would be to place it on the agenda and um, uh, deliberate have discussion and have a vote to approve it as a minor change. Now, I recommend taking these separately. Uh, the first one being the greenhouse. Uh, the, the site plan was in the Google Drive for everybody to review for the meeting. I don't know if we have any paper copies. Maybe. I wasn't able to print one out because we don't have anybody in the office right now. We got one. Excellent. And I so your can, old one. Can you? We did your first greenhouse. Yep. Yeah. Oh, wow. Back to back. Yeah. So can you very briefly walk us through what you're trying to do with that one? So it's uh, similar to the first one. Um, it was kind of you know our plan to put up a second one as soon as the, uh, the season ended. Uh, so basically, um, it's a hoop house, so it doesn't require a building permit or anything. Uh, plastic top. Um, and our intention is to basically start the season there. A little difficult to grow in the summer inside one of those things, as we just learned. Uh, so basically, we'll start again in the fall. So we've started like a new round in the, in the, the existing one that we have. Uh, we'll try to grow through the winter. Uh, we can't really grow in January, we're pretty sure. Um, so we'll hopefully see what happens starting in February. Um, we don't use any lights in the greenhouse. So it's kind of an experiment. See what happens if we start in February when the sun is increasing. And then that harvest should be done in May. Um, and then, like I said, we'll start the seeds for next year in one of those greenhouses. And this one and the usage of it will be substantially similar to the one that we already approved? Yep, exact same thing. The only difference is, is that this is in a different location. Can you describe that location in vis a -vis where the first one is? So it's about maybe 100, 150 feet, um, I think, going west. It's going up the hill. Mm -hmm. So it's on the top of the hill. Um, basically in the far part of the, uh, the field. And this is in the resi residential agricultural Correct. zoning section Correct. versus the previous one was in the commercial zone section. Correct. So for the record, this is just a slightly different location. Yeah, yeah, we okay. basically, the, the other greenhouse is right up to the commercial residential zone. Okay. So just in the interest of clarity, because I also had questions about this, there ordinarily uh, is a state statute that prevents us from regulating Houses, but mm -hmm. that same state statute uh, calls out marijuana enterprises as not being included in it. Right. Uh, I know that I had some questions about that and received some questions about it, so I just wanted to go on the record. Uh, that's why we're looking at this, and it's not something that's just by right, right. Uh, whereas a ordinary greenhouse would be. You are offset in this particular case from the uh, boundary by 40 feet versus the first one was by 20 feet, correct? Yeah, it's, it's farther away from the boundary. Okay, very good. Dimensions are exactly the same, so it's a 36 foot uh, wide and a 96 feet long. Yep. Uh, 
it is within the area that you originally had laid out for the purposes of growing uh, your product. Correct. Okay. Is there, um, you said there's no lighting. Are there any electrical uh, uh, conduits that have to oh, be Oh yeah, built? yeah, definitely. So we, we've already run that. So the electrical inspector, uh, you know, he inspected at the same time as everything else. Sure. So we, we've already planned this for a year. So um, there's already uh, propane, natural gas, propane already run out there. So that's in one end of the greenhouse. And then the other end of the greenhouse is the electrical. So, so just, to, just to be yeah. clear, I mean, you said that it does not require a building permit. Correct. However, it, it, it had to be reviewed by the building inspector for the purposes of making sure that the utilities that you're placing in that, on that location uh, are, are to code. Uh, I don't know if the building inspector over, uh, well, I think he overlooks the electrical inspector. Correct. So the electrical inspector came out and then the propane guy. There's another inspector. Yep. So okay. he's a gas guy. So right. yeah, those two people came out, inspected it. Um, so that we just had them inspect the second greenhouse. Um, you know, we haven't obviously put the greenhouse up. It's just the parts that are coming out of the ground. So all mm -hmm. the piping, everything, uh, we had them come out and inspect at the same time as the first greenhouse. Okay. Is there a separate utility service into this area, or does this depend on the utility that is coming from the very first structure that you have? What I'm saying is, is yep. are they in serial, or are they going to be running in parallel? Um, you don't know? You I, well, I can explain how it works. So we have, um, you know, like the, the central panel, yep. and that's in uh, what we call the security trailer, yep. um, which eventually when we build the building, we're actually just going to cut around that and throw the security trailer out. Um, so off of that panel, you know, runs maybe a thousand feet underground to one of the two sheds that we have. In one of those sheds, there's another panel. Mm -hmm. And then out of that panel, you know, you got little switches. Yep. Out of the, I'm not the electrical guy, I was like, right, out of that panel runs to the greenhouse. The first one. The first one. And then that, and then there's a whole set, you know, another set of piping that runs out to the other greenhouse. From that shed? From, yeah, from the panel. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it does not go from the first greenhouse into the second no, greenhouse? No. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Further questions from the board? Yeah. A couple of questions. Um, one is, so the seedlings that you will grow in the second one. Yep. Um, they're all, for both of them, all those seedlings are going to be planted on your lot? Or are you propagating for somebody else? No, no. So uh, we're not sure which, you know, which greenhouse the seedlings are going in, but they'll go in one of the greenhouses. Um, but those are just to go on our own field. Okay, and yeah. they're also going to be the low odor plants because we're already getting odor. Yeah, yeah. Issues. So, um, I mean, we lost a bunch already, so we just don't have the manpower. Next year, we'll, we'll figure it out. But uh, if you, in terms of the odor, I mean, they're they're what's called automatics, so they by default don't have like the terpenes and the odor of you know what would be deemed a, you know a full length plant. Uh, those are just too difficult to grow around here. Not that you guys have ever done it, but they just last too long in September and October, and then they get really moldy and bud rot. And even though we have them on some of ours right now, which is very sad. Um, the, but the but the propagation yeah. part isn't what produces the odor. It's when it yeah, ripens. Yeah, it's only like the last okay. couple weeks. Okay, so the fact that we're allowing the second greenhouse wouldn't increase the odor. No, I mean, if anything, it would, it would hold it in. Okay. Um, yeah, no, it, uh, it, uh, yeah, we're not adding any action. And, and the electricity is used for the irrigation system in it? What uh, is the electricity used for? So you have the, the pro you, you propane's like, heat, right? Yeah, propane. So you have a heater, you know, yeah. like a hanging heater. And then you have fans. So the, all the fans are That's circulating the, the air. So it's just like any greenhouse you've probably ever gone into. Okay. Um, there's nothing like, we don't have any lights or anything. Um, in terms of the water irrigation, um, we're trying to figure that out so because we we had to, it's gonna be the winter um, so what will happen is we'll probably have tanks in the greenhouse and off of those tanks you know we'll feed it you know through our well and then off of those tanks it will run through a system but it's, it's like gravity fed you know so there's maybe a small pump but okay yeah right maybe someday we'll come back and ask for lights but I don't think so and this and this <laughs> is located within your fence compound oh yeah 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 okay and did you wind up growing tree, uh, plants for maturity in the greenhouse? What do you do? What like the one we have now? No, field, right? no, we learned a hard lesson. So it's just too hot in that greenhouse, yeah. and then it was too humid in the greenhouse. So it's strictly for propagation. Ooh, yeah, well, like right now we're yeah. going for it, so we're trying to get a, a harvest in, you know, before Christmas. 
So we're starting again, you know, little babies, and they're going to grow, and they're automatics. And when I say automatics, usually a, a marijuana plant, you'll grow, start in May or June, and it comes due, you know, when the sun's coming down in September, October, when the days are getting less and less. So it feels the amount of sun's getting less and less. Uh, where um, if someone's growing indoors, they can grow their plants and make them big by growing 18 hours of light a day. But when you want to flower them, you switch to 12 hours on, 12 hours off. An automatic is something that the seeds will say 70 days, 75 days, 80 days, whatever the seeds say, they basically come due, no matter if you kept them under 24 hour light or if they got 12 hour light, they're automatic. They automatically come due. Doesn't matter about the lights. Okay. Um, where indoors, if you had 14 hours of light a day and eight hours off, it just would never flower. It would eventually just kind of die out. Um, but with these, they'll just, doesn't matter how many, how many hours of light. So we're gonna actually start some now, even though the light's going down every day, it's gonna be dark <laughs> real soon and early. Uh, we're gonna see what happens. They should harvest, you know, December, and then, you know, probably take January off. It's just the light's not gonna be that great. And then in February, when the light starts to increase every day again, we're gonna plant again, and then that should be done, you know, April, May, right at the same time we need to start seeds. Okay, so you're going to grow a crop in the greenhouse. Oh, yeah. For, okay. Yeah, and we don't know if it's going to work. It might not work. We're okay. just kind of there okay. already. Okay. What so. you're saying, though, is eventually it gets too hot in the greenhouse. Well, it gets so too hot. So in night. June to, like, okay. we learned our lesson. June, July, August, it was 120 degrees in that greenhouse and, like, 10, 15% uh, humidity. Okay, I don't want to get yeah, bogged was, down in the details. Yeah, but yeah. Further, uh, further questions? Yeah. All right, so the last time we handled this, uh, we did it by having a motion and a, a vote to approve it as a minor change and then confirmed uh, with a follow-up letter. I actually have the uh, motion we used last time. Well, you know, it's the same helpful. structure, right? So I could vote, move it again. And right? I guess while we have town council sitting at the table with us. Sure. That makes sense, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <I vote. laughs> uh, so this is the way it read last time, which I think would be the same thing you're looking for. Um, um, I move to approve a modification of the special permit granted to Sun Royal Farms to operate an outdoor grow marijuana establishment at 69 Gardner Road as a minor engineering change to allow the addition of a temporary 34 by 96 agricultural cold frame greenhouse type structure that has a roof made of plastic, does not have a concrete slab foundation, and does not require a building permit to put up to be located as shown on the temporary site plan submitted by Bobeck Engineering yep. tonight? same one. Yep. Okay, and I would add to it to include um, electrical and gas service because that right. issue came up and you're specifically requesting that. All right. And, and did you say it was Sun Royal Farm? Or is, is it Royal Sun Farm? Royal Sun. All right. But I might have transposed. Yeah, it's yeah it's just making sure. Do we have a second? Hi, I'm seconding this motion. Hearing a first and a second. Uh, any further discussion? All right, well, we, Mr. Damalia has not joined us yet, so having uh, a quorum in the room, I'm calling a vote. Uh, I think so Erica can vote. She voted on the special permit, yeah, correct. Oh, can you? Um, yeah. yes. All right, so uh, let's have a vote then. I'm Erica Dack, I also go I. Mr. Steiger, aye. Christopher Monroe, aye. Right. So we have a second item for you. Uh, and to summarize this, uh, we had a, a, I had a similar discussion uh, with Places Associates about this. Uh, and I wanted to bring it in front of the board uh, for possibly the similar treatment, but I leave it to the board for discussion. Uh, the, uh, the applicant is asking for a change in how the water limits are set uh, but I'll, um, I'll let you discuss that all right yeah so what we're looking to do is right now we have 5,000 gallons a day of uh, quote-unquote limit um, and what we did is we reached out to uh, Proventure uh, engineering um, just kind of confirm um, you know what we we're looking for um, and what we're trying to do is instead of doing 5,000 gallon limit every day just set it to 35,000 gallons a week. Um, we're dealing with a 5,000 gallon tank that we hold on site. Um, so it would just, it would make it so, you know, the days that we can water, we can water 10, 12, 13,000 gallons a day. The days that we don't water, 
you know, we're not like forced to try to store this water to, to play a game here. So it, it's the same amount of water per week that we're allowed. We're just going to average it over seven days because it's not like we water every day. And, you know. And if I remember correctly, you're also proposing a ten thousand uh, dollar, excuse me, ten thousand gallon cap, uh, along with the alterations of the thirty-five thousand a week. Yeah, I think so. If that was in there, that is what it says here. Yeah. To to add to what is in the record, uh, because I received it just before the meeting, um, the engineering company did send over a stamp dated version. Uh, it is not yet in the file because it came in in the eve before, uh, but we have received that, so we do have a. a Stamp the same letter that's on the re I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's a fair it's question. It's on here, uh, right? It's posted. Yes, You're just it, saying uh, it's time stamped. Well, the, the letter that we have right now from Provincial was actually uh, dated August 11th, 2022. That's the one we have on our uh, Google Drive. I think he emailed it today back. Water. Yeah, we just got it. I I have not done um, I have not done a line by line comparison of it to confirm that it is the exact same document. If that's what the question is, it is. I mean, it's important for I think this board to have clarity in terms of whether or not there's any differences between the original August and this letter. Since is there time since for we us just to review got quickly? that before the meeting. Right. Would it would it be okay if we push that one off to our next oh, meeting? Yeah. You got any problems with that? No, okay. I'm here. So this one's a week. <laughs> just from a clarity perspective, this would in theory mean that you could take three days consecutively, ten thousand gallons, and one day therefore spread the other five thousand <coughs> gallons if you wanted to. In the extreme case. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. So it's not one day for ten thousand gallons, but it's multiple days of multiple days of ten thousand gallons, not to exceed the whole. Yeah. Quota of 30,000 gallons. Yeah, just limit to 10,000 a day, which is fine because we have a 5,000 gallon tank. So we can. You would push that into that. Into well, what that. we could do is that means that we could use bring 10,000 more yeah. in and we'd have 5,000 extra. So we could actually do 15,000, but we're only taking 10,000 out the day from the ground. Well, Because we've already stored 5,000 know, from another day. If, if that makes sense. If we're kicking this down the road, I'd prefer to, to table the discussion for now uh, because we're, uh, we're pressed for time. So I, I, that, that's fine. Okay, we can, from a timing perspective, I understand. Uh, especially if the applicant is, is okay with that. Yeah, I'm perfectly fine. It awesome. doesn't matter to me. I, I did have one, one follow up question. Okay. Yeah. Given the circumstances that we had this summer, yeah. did you have any issues with the well and the no. production of the water? No, I mean, our well produces 50 gallons per minute. I, I understand yeah. that, but because of the unusual circumstances that we've had thus far this year, okay, I take your word for it. Yeah. I'm in the middle of the wetland, so. Yeah, I, I have not had any complaints raised to me, but it's been a odd situation with land use this summer. So I, I, I get it, but it's also been an unusual weather year. And it yeah, was really hot. Summer. I think mean, that's where the smell came from. It, when it was really, it was just right at that time. Right. Well, we are pressed for time tonight, so thank, right. you. And, thank you. And thank you for your patience allowing us to push out. We'll see you shortly. Thank you. So moving, moving down the agenda, we have a joint meeting with EDC to discuss the town center overlay project and the solar bylaw project with Jennifer from MRPC. Um, Whitney, you will need to call the EDC to order. And just so everybody knows, the speaker is on in the room and everyone can hear you. Okay, good evening. Thank you. Whitney Freiberg. I'm the chairperson of the Hubbard Economic Development Committee. I will call this, oops, call this meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. Uh, we are here with a, uh, a quorum uh, with uh, Christopher Monroe, Cheryl Ryan Chan, and myself. Katie Young is unable to attend. Uh, we're going to dispense with, uh, let me uh, ask one thing. We don't need to do the open meeting law again, do we? Uh, I don't think that's necessary. Okay, fine. Okay. So we're going to dispense with uh, approval of the minutes from our last meeting because this is not our typical uh, uh, me uh, scheduled meeting. It's a special meeting. Um, everyone, I believe, has received the agenda. And um, and I am ready to hear from Jennifer Burney. She is our technical assistant representative from MRPC with our uh, commercial overlay. <coughs> 
bylaw or a commercial overlay district bylaw or a ten cent town center overlay bylaw yet to be determined a definitive uh, title for this. So welcome Jennifer and uh, take the floor. Well, thank, thank you very much, Whitney. And once again, yeah. I, I apologize profusely for running behind schedule on this where uh, we're working through some things. So thank you for your patience and grace. You bet. Hi everyone, um, my name is Jennifer Varney. I'm a senior planner with MRPC and I've been working with the town of Hubbardston on a number of projects over the last two years, um, helping with the master plan, land use chapter and the um, housing chapter. Um, Chris, Christopher, you wanted me to start with the solar um, what, bylaw whatever, discussion, right? Whatever is easier for you, the floor is yours. Yeah, why don't I start with that? Because I think that's just making sure we're on the same page and um, my presentation's like six or seven minutes long sure. and then we can just, um, I think someone has to give me um, the power to share my screen unless I can just do that. I'm not sure. I did make you a presenter. Let me... Oh, okay. Let me see. Let me see if I can do that. Okay, I think, let me just see. And if you can, I can temporarily make you the host. Yeah, I'm just looking on my screen to see <clears throat> where it is. Usually it's, um, I have a little button that allows it. Let's see, participants. Hmm. Again. It came up in the beginning when uh, before we switched in progress. Mm -hmm. No, now it just came up. Can you hear me? Can you what hear just me? came? I, just, I can hear you. I just got a prompt that says recording in progress. Yeah, I just. I did too. I just uh, hit that button. We are broadcasting live, but uh, just. To oh, sure okay. I hit okay. The record button. Oh, okay. And now I see the menu. So. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, so, so I, I think someone's got to go on. So I'm going to make you the host temporarily if you can make me the host back. Okay. Back. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, so. All right, so now you should be able to do anything. All righty. Let me just go to my desktop. You know, nothing's ever easy on Zoom. Nah. <laughs> right? Nah. Uh, files. Of course, it's not just going to go right to my. Um, I can't. It's not letting me go to my desktop, which I have it right there. We'll get there. Sorry, everyone. Hmm. All right, let's try Oops, going. Can you screen. see my screen? Yes, we yes. can see your desktop. Yes. Okay. All right, so I think here it is. Um, it just didn't, so let's see if everyone can see this. Can it go on the big screen? Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Uh, it hasn't, no. hopefully, it is not loaded yet. <laughs> it's your okay. files are showing up. Maybe she has multiple screens and she needs to be on the right screen. Mm. There is, is it possible it's a screen setting? Or if she has multiple Yeah, screens. she's saying this, your screen sharing is paused on my end. Are you seeing files again? Yes. Yeah, we can see the files and okay. see your mouse. Okay. So, all right. So I just need to go to the Hubbardston. Yeah, I think the the screen just froze. Yep. Yeah, we can see the icon. Do you see a, a solar? Okay. So great. We see the icon. Okay. It did not open the. Here we go. Yet. You don't see the PowerPoint. Not yet. Nope. Hmm. It's 
on my screen. Jennifer, may I? Uh, what are you seeing in the background? Uh, We're in your desktop, and we have and, and your file. Yep. With your photos are open in your desktop. Yeah. Hmm. Jennifer Francois has a, a question do you, for you. Do you have multiple? Do you have multiple monitors? Yes. If you have multiple monitors, what's happening is is you need to you need to bring. There you go. There it is. Uh -huh. No, I don't have. It's oh, there. okay. I I only have my laptop. So here we are. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. So um, let's just. Okay. So I'm going to be helping uh, the town of Hubbardston uh, with its large scale solar bylaw. Um, and just to bring everyone up to speed so we're all on the same page, the bylaw was created in 2010 and amended in 2015 and 2018. And the large scale uh, solar is ground or rooftop mounted systems, which are allowed in all zoning districts by special permit. And speaking to Christopher, he updated uh, me with that the town recently passed a battery energy storage by law to address safety concerns and siting issues. And I know last year um, when I was talking to the board, that was a big thing that you wanted to work on. So congrats on that. Um, so if you, if you can see this map, this was part of the land use chapter that I worked on with the town. We looked at the location of the six solar farms and they're sited on a total of 113.6 acres. And typically um, when you have a solar project, it will occupy that land for 15 years or more. Um, in FY19, the town had revenue of $92,000 from solar projects. And I apologize for my voice. I've had a cold for about five weeks that I just can't shake. So, um, so just a little background on large scale solar projects. They've really increased in the last 10 years or so um, due to grants and ta tax incentives. Solar developers are looking to find landowners with sufficient acreage on viable land. So you tend to find it in communities that have large tracts of open land. I was the town planner in Bolton. We were prime for it when they first came out um, and we had one of the largest solar uh, developments early on in the process. So Hubbardston is you know, um, a, a community that would um, definitely uh, be on the radar for uh, solar developers. I mentioned that they're looking for long-term lease agreements for 15 years or longer. And then the other thing that um, communities are faced with is community solar has also increased. And often communities don't have municipal land available. So they're trying to figure out where can we put these solar projects. Um, and you know, many have cited them on capped landfills or former gravel pits. So the land has to be in proximity to a substation three phase power line. Uh, it requires clear, relatively flat land with no major obstructions. And the scale of the solar projects and community projects um, range. Um, and technology is always changing too, so they can make them smaller, but typically you need six to seven acres for every megawatt. So a five uh, megawatt project usually requires about 30 to uh, 35 acres of suitable land. So Hubbardston's, you know, land uses, as we all know, single family homes are the most common type of developed land use in Hubbardston. So it accounts for about 4.8% of the total acres of the town. And it also has large amounts of developed forest or wetlands and water um, amounting up to 87.8 acres. So that limits where solar, large solar developments can go. Part of the um, master plan uh, land use chapter, the planning board had asked me to also look at gravel pits um, and earth removal um, sites. So we looked at those, there are several of uh, um, formal gravel pits in uh, the community totaling about 472 plus acres. There's no active ones when we looked at that um, last year. 
The town does own a gravel pit on Pitcherville Road, um, which at the time when they did the land use um, chapter, it was under study. So for subsidized senior housing, I'm not sure where that stands now. So you can let me know. Um, so when we did the master plan, we did a survey. So that was last June of 2021. And we asked participants what top land uses were desired once a gravel pit is no longer in operation. So number one response was a public park or playground. You can see 46.83%. Uh, number two was solar development. And number three was uh, protecting it as open space. So I just want to show you some of the other um, surrounding communities or communities in Massachusetts that have done adaptive reuses. I live in um, Hudson. So this um, project right here, I don't know if you can see my little mouse going. We currently have an over 55 development that's under construction on a formal gravel pit, um, which is down the street from where I live. And that's being done by the Toll Brothers. Uh, Bolton, as I mentioned, and that's this project right here at the top, um, permitted a 5.96 uh, megawatt solar farm on 26 acres. And that was a formal, um, former gravel pit behind Bolton Orchards Farms, um, and they owned that property. And then Concord recently approved a 274-unit residential development on a 46-plus acre formal gravel pet operation. Sudbury acquired, and I'm not sure how they acquired that, if they acquired it through CPA funds, but they acquired a formal um, former uh, quarry operation. They put out an RFP and they got three bids including a greenhouse operation, a residential development with 300 plus units and uh, 33 um, age restricted condos. And then Saugus conducted a master plan study, which is another interesting way to look at what type of uses could be done. And that would include mixed use and open space. So just, you know, considerations as we start looking at this, you know, um, if Hubbardson does identify gravel pits, maybe all of them, or some of them for future solar reuse, should the town also consider other uses, such as parks, playgrounds, open space, housing, or a mix? Um, you know, are there other suitable properties in the town that could be included um, if we did a solar bylaw? So I've done two so large scale solar bylaws, um, one in Bolton when I was the town planner there for six years, and we identified specific properties, and then also in South Grove. The other thing that Christopher and I talked about was there could be the potential right now, um, the town um, isn't mandated, but in the future, if there is a close, you know, MBA, uh, MBTA stop, there could be a requirement um, for housing. So, you know, does the town want to tie up all these gravel pits for solar, or do you want to also allow potential housing, which you can see has been done in other communities. So um, I'm on my last two slides. So looking at the grant application, these were the things that uh, the goals that we wanted the the bylaw or the rules and regulations or the application to include that was really important to have a pre-application conference and hearing notice to have a minimum lot size um, which is currently two acres um, and the town said they desire a 10 acre minimum and a 20 acre maximum currently there's no maximum land area or lotage limit so the one concern i have is uh, and I'd, I'd have to do a little bit more research, is 20 acres enough? It, you know, it wasn't in Bolton when that one was done. Um, there's a preference for siting it on disturbed land, such as agricultural gravel pits or other areas where vegetation has been removed. You know, screening, fencing, all of those things, slope limitations, uh, tree cutting, clearing restrictions, protection of historic buildings and other priority landscapes and making sure you have setbacks from abutting properties, open space and streams, 
height limits and habitat protection, you know, and all those things, uh, erosion and sediment control and making sure that it complies with, uh, you know, any dark sky um, standards or visual impacts. So the next steps for me um, are to review AFOL. I'm told that they ha have a very good bylaw by the planning board. Um, also, Bolton and South Borough, um, again, who um, all have large-scale solar bylaws. I don't know if there's any others that the planning board would like me to look at. Also, um, identifying potential property, so that be working very closely with the planning board, um, and possible land use con um, conf conflicts, like, you know, are there other things that the, that the town would want to see? I think um, Christopher mentioned that there um maybe one close to the town center um could that potentially be a property that could be included in the town center overlay and not really a solar project um and then i would draft a bylaw or that may or may not include the overlay district depending on how we move forward so with that um questions and answers comments all right, just so where we have a little bit of order here, any questions from the planning board first? I guess it's not a question, but rather a comment. I know that Alice, myself, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, worked on some potential modifications. So I think you have some good sources of, uh, uh, within the planning board, um, that are, I, I guess, I don't want to speak for you, Alice, but I say that we have some we have some good information in terms of things that we think are merit some review and changes. So I would urge you to take advantage of both Alice and my past work, and uh, we can certainly try to figure out a way uh, that is easiest for us to meet with you. Yes, uh, and what was your name again? I'm sorry. My first name is Francois. My last name is Steiger. I'm a member of the planning board. Okay. And the other person Perfect. I was referencing. And um, the other Christopher person. did mention that um, when we spoke a couple weeks ago. So that would be great. Okay, good. And, and just from a, 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 a meeting management, uh, just so we've had a bunch of people from the public filter in because we do have a public hearing. So I just want to announce to everyone. We're currently in our agenda talking with uh, MRPC, which is our regional planning authority. Uh, about a grant project that we're working on with them for doing a, um, a modification of our solar bylaws uh, that's been requested by the planning board and we've heard constituent feedback on it. So just to let everybody know that that's what we're discussing there. Uh, we are running a little bit behind schedule, so I ask for everyone's patience. Uh, we will be certainly getting to that public hearing, but we have a few more things we need to get through first. Thank you. Uh, and uh, questions from the EBC for Jennifer on that one? Are there any? All right, well, Jennifer, if you're ready, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the town center overlay projects. Okay, let me just pull that up real quick. Thank you, Jennifer. And I was on mute before, and my answer was not right now. Don't have any questions. Oh, right okay. Now. Sorry. All right, great. Yeah. Oh, no. Can everyone see my screen here? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, terrific. And I'm going to try to go through this. This one's a little bit um, longer, um, but I'm going to try to move through it quickly. Um, so the Hubbardson Town Center Zoning pro uh, Project, and as Whitney said, we're, we don't quite have a name yet for it, so that's <laughs> what we're going to call it right now. Um, so MRPC is assisting the Town of Hubbardston with creating an overlay district bylaw. Uh, focused in the town center. Uh, we've, you know, have many tasks. I don't want to go through this. It's very detailed, but we've done a lot of work um, starting last fall, looking at, you know, all of the studies, analyzing everything, um, meeting with the EDC and the planning board. We did a site walk in February, and then following that, really took a deep, deep dive into Hubbardston's uh, zoning, um, looking at the historic district, because as we walked around that town, the town center is just such an intact, beautiful historic area. Um, and we weren't sure if, if it had a local historic district. So I will get to that. 
um, re reviewed uh, assessor parcel data for every single property in the town center, analyzed existing uses, um, explored you know redevelopment and infill opportunities, and developed a number of maps, um, and then also looking at peer communities and um, the EDC and the planning board when they met when we met as a dual committee back late fall, Alice had a list of communities that the planning board had looked at as peer communities. So those were recommended. So that, those are the communities I looked at and I also added a couple of additional communities. So let me just keep going on. So a couple surveys that are really important that I looked at. One was the Hubbardson 2016 Town Center Survey where residents indicated a desire for an active, walkable, vibrant town center with approved parking and sidewalks. I know that the town got some complete streets funding to help with that. Uh, looking for more, you know, range of services, more food choices, restaurants, pubs, shops, etc., and affordable housing options. Um, beautification improvements such as flowers, greenery, and trees, and really wanting to maintain that historic character, that small town charm and family-friendly atmosphere. Atmosphere. I mentioned we did a, a survey in June 2021 for the master plan. We focused on a section for the town center. Um, uh, participants identified the town center as a top priority for the town uh, to work on while also considering you know, work, uh, preserving its farms. There was a preference for the town center footprint, footprint to expand to accommodate commercial and job growth. And again, the same kind of top, top uses identified, restaurants, retail store services, and that importance of the sidewalk and bike connections with the street, streetscape improvements. Just quickly, I'm gonna go through this. I wanna bring everyone on the same page as what are zoning principles, because we talk about these a lot. So in this image here, this is uh, Hubbardson's town center. It has two rings. Basically, you want a compact, walkable town center that uh, most people will walk 5, 10, 15 minutes max. Uh, so this is a half mile. Jennifer, can um, I interrupt, uh, interrupt for, for a sec? What? Uh, if I may interrupt for a second. Uh, can yep. you please send us a copy of this slide deck? We're currently watching this off of a 15-inch screen. Uh, oh, sure. We, Absolutely. We have, I uh, completely so will. With the big and it might be great if the town could put that on the website, too. Absolutely. Uh, um, I, I so I, it is very difficult. But the point being that um, Hubbardston meets the smart growth principles because it is such a walkable town center. You have the bones and the structure there, um, which many communities don't have. Um, an overlay district, it gets, people get very confused when we talk about an overlay, what does that mean? It is a special zoning district that think of it as floating over an existing base zone. So the zoning underneath doesn't change, this kind of sits on top of it waiting to be used. It can share, it, like it can sit completely over one district like a town center, but it can also share um, other boundaries um, or cut across um, other zones. So, you know, you could have it hop, skip, and jump um, and, you know, sit over a residential district and a town center or sit over the town center, a little bit of residential and the commercial. Um, there's usually regulations or incentives that are attached to the overlay district, such as, um, more density, um, you know, reducing setbacks, that type of thing. Um, and it really is a way of targeting development in a certain area, uh, targeting uses or controlling appearances. And that is often done with design guidelines. And here we are with design guidelines. We talk about design guidelines and design standards. Guidelines are uh, advise they set a design parameter um, but they're not mandatory so design standards are mandatory they can be very simple and they can be very complex um, so i've worked in communities where we've just you know wanted things you know a sidewalk in front benches 
landscaping. Um, we didn't get down to the house has to be a certain color. It has to have these type of windows. So we, we'll talk about that further, but I just don't want people to get scared when they hear guidelines or design scare, um, design, design guidelines. So just quickly, um, we looked at uh, build out analysis. So the town, due to large law and frontage requirements, you really have a small retail social center um, that doesn't really allow for any further development. So we looked at the town center, it's about 67 acres. This shows what's been developed, um, but there's no available land to be developed without constraints. You have, you know, again, large dimensional requirements. Uh, we looked at the commercial district, that's uh, 341 acres. Again, there's no available land that can be developed without constraints. And when we mean constraints, um, it means it's unsuitable for development. So you've got, you know, uh, wetlands, um, uh, slopes over a certain, you know, 26. It's permanently protected, so there, there's constraints. So the answer about the Hubbardston Town Center, Hubbardston does not have a local historic district designation, although it has many historic properties in your town center, but what it does have is two properties listed, listed with the National Historic um, District designation. Um, so your town center historic common was designated in 2000, and that consi consists of the town common, the first parish Unitarian church, and the cemetery. And then the rural Glen Cemetery was also designated in 2020. Um, and the district was named as one of the one, one of the 1,000 places to visit Massachusetts by great places in Massachusetts um, by the commission. So case studies, this is what Case studies are a way of looking at other communities and discovering what's desirable and maybe not so desirable. So you're picking, you know, things from that community, looking at their land use, looking at their land use development. You're exploring, do they have creative zoning? Do they have other ini initiatives communities may that they may have adopted? Um, Keep in mind that you may look at something in a community and say, I really love that general, you know, that old general store from the 1800s It allows, you know, housing up above and, you know, a little store down below. But often when you look at the zoning, that's not allowed under current zoning. So it's a pre-existing use. The other thing that you could look at a community and say, oh, they have an overlay district, but they haven't, nothing's been built yet under that. Um, and I can give you an example. We did the overlay district in Bolton in 2012 with a barn bylaw. And I was just speaking to someone last week that's actually utilizing that. So we're nine years, 10 years out, if I'm doing my math, 10 years out. And that hasn't really been used yet. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, Jennifer, can I interrupt for just a moment? Yes. Can we yes. please go back to uh, two slides before uh, the one of 1,000 places to visit. Yes. And that's by great places. In Massachusetts. And it's, I think I have a typo there. It's by the Historic Commission, and I can send okay. that to you. Okay. And I just want to say that these are things that, that, you know, you can tap into that um, Hubbardston has many, you know, open space, sure. special places, beautiful town center, and these historic national historic well that reputation alone of one of 1,000 places to visit yeah. would be yeah. tremendous so i'd like to tap into that so thank you for yeah. coming back for me thank you for that you're so welcome so hubbardston um the town center is intended for traditional town center um and residential activities um it has very low density for commercial development um it only allows single and two-family housing and it doesn't allow for mixed uses. So those are some of the constraints. There is uh, there is one yeah. more point that you should uh, probably add to that. Uh, yes. Our town center district is also our wireless communication overlay district. Yeah, okay. 
which is also why we have so many people in the room tonight. Ah, okay. Uh, can I ask on this uh, only single and two family housing, uh, mm -hmm. is, is that in a, a, a conflict with our um, short term rentals that we've recently uh, uh, discussed and, uh, and that uh, I would know that I, I mean you'd have to talk to really the building inspector on that every community some communities are silent on it and some communities have restrictions on it okay. um, so I think it's how the um, building inspector interprets that okay does anyone from the planning board uh, see any conflict with that um, so we passed a accessory apartment by law right yeah, because, which does document. allow short-term rentals with you know the restrictions on it but they're reasonable I I think it's more accurate to, to say that it's not necessarily that it allows it it doesn't restrict it specifically so it's not something that is a specific uh, approval or, or grant it just doesn't have it as a restriction in it. right okay because some communities will say you know nothing under a 30, you know, 30 days, or right. they'll sure. actually specify these are the areas of the community that you can have. We, um, um, we do have a bed and breakfast as a use by right in, yep. uh, in I believe, every zone. Is that true so. for town center? I know it is so. residential. It yeah. is for any residential, any residential. I just, I just pulled that out this afternoon. I can read it to you. No. Yeah, I would rather so, not go too far down the road just to limit the discussion for the sake of time. Sure. But. Okay. Yeah. So looking at the, some of these communities, and I've provided uh, Whitney and the EDC, I don't know if the planning board got a copy, but it's probably a 48-page document. Yeah. It's very um, detailed. So, uh, you know, looking at Ashburnham, I have the zoning broken up, the zoning map, all of them. I'm just taking little pieces from each community. And the same when I'm going over, you know, build out analysis, the, you know, what's allowed in the zoning districts. That's in that um in that detailed um study or review right so looking at ashburn ham they do have a mixed use overlay that's less restrictive um wow. than um hubbardston um and so you know that is one community where we can look at their mixed use village overlay in more detail um uh, the Jennifer, town of if I can interrupt for a moment, we just had another yeah. member of the planning board join, uh, John Damalia. Can you uh, uh, promote him to a panelist, please? Okay, let's see how I... Uh, you go to attendees, and then you select the attendee yeah. tab, and then you hover your mouse over, and it's going to give you the yeah. opportunity to make panelists. I think it's because I have my... Um, I'm on full screen, so... Unless he does not object being... Be, and based on those metrics. At least until the presentation is over, and then you can take what over. Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, where are my... If, uh, if you don't have it right away, just uh, continue with the presentation, and I'll add them back when uh, when you make me host when you're done. Okay. Just, just in the interest of time. No problem. We're just okay. we're dealing with technology. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the community of Barry um, allows single and two family. They also allow a wide range of uses, such as antique gift shops, specialty business, retail stores, galleries. Um, and again, looking closely at Hubbardston uses as it compares to some of these other communities, you know, what could be missing from Hubbardston's uses. Um, that could be included um, that makes sense for the town of Hubbardston. So we will do that. Um, their uh, dimensional requirements are less restrictive than Hubbardston's. Um, Princeton, I think I have that spelled wrong, uh, is more restrictive than Hubbardston when it comes to lot area and frontage, but allows reduced setbacks. Rutland has less restrictive dimensional requirements than Hubbardston. They have both a village district and a town center district, and they allow for multifamily housing and mixed uses. 
the town of Sterling has a compact walkable town center. Um, you know that they were, uh, I worked with them on complete streets and they're really trying to make it much more walkable. Um, they've got a lot of funding for that. Their zoning is not very clear on the lot area frontage requirement and it does not allow a mix of uses. And that's one thing I want, I want to make a comment. When your zoning is not very clear and it takes a planner that's researching, um, making it difficult, then that means it's difficult for the applicant. Uh, Sterling also does not have design standards or guidelines. Templeton um, has a village district that allows for mixed uses. It has less stringent requirements than Hubbardston. Westminster. Um, their, uh, their requirements are much less restrictive than Hubbardston. They have a site plan review standards that really are like design guidelines almost. They're looking at the building placement and orientation, where the entrances are on buildings, which are really important, especially when you want them you know, facing a street, looking at landscaping, pedestrian facilities, parking, building facades, massing windows, you know, they have signs, illumination. Um, so that's something that we can look at and explore more. And then I call these bonus case studies because these are communities that I was asked to look at, but I added them in. And again, you know, some, some of these communities are nothing like Hubbardston, but what can you learn from them? What are they doing well that um, we could take to consider for Hubbardston? So for Bolton, I included this because I, I, I did work on the mixed use overlay there. And this overlay is not contiguous. So it you know is in one part near 495 and 117, and then there's gaps and then it continues the overlay. So it's in a general location where the town wanted to see development along 117. Um, and it crosses multiple zoning districts. So you have a business district, a limited, you know, business district. We also created design standards and a design review board. Um, and it's worked really well. The mixed use overlay allows for increased and reduced dimensions as well as additional uses. So that's something Hubbardston could consider doing something like this. Um, and creating, you know, either design standards, which are required, or design regulations, which are advisory and not, um, you know, not obligated by them. The other thing that they created, which I um, have mentioned to the planning board and the EDC before, is they created a barn preservation bylaw. And this was a way to save the historic barns in the town center. Um, and so they allowed accessory uses such as artisan crafts with retail, but B and B's, antique stores, accessory apartments. It's highly regulated. I mean, um, you have to have on-site parking. It's limited by employees. It's going to be owner-occupied. I mean, there's a lot of um, requirements that go along with that. But it's another thing we can look at as we look at the town center. Okay, Jennifer, can I say on, yes. on Bolton? So it appears that so far Bolton is uh, actually uh, a, a community that has that that real overlay and jumping from one to the other. Yeah, there are a couple of them that um, have that that we've looked at, but that's absolutely right, Whitney. And I know when we've done the site walks down there, that's something that we talked about. Yeah. Um. So. Yep. Okay. Okay. And then the last, I think this is the last community, is Bristol, Rhode Island. It's a much lar larger community, but it's also balancing lots of different uses. It's trying to protect that historic waterfront, open space, and a historic character. It's got a lot of old antique homes. So the town center has multiple zoning districts to address this. It does allow for denser housing in that town center versus the rest of the town. Whereas Hubbardston just has, you know, across the board, basically two acre zoning, 200 foot, you know, frontage. So um, it has a historic overlay zoning district, and this is intended to preserve um, the heritage of the town. So it's applying additional design standards for buildings and other uses. 
And one thing that the EDC um, that we talked about in the planning board, I think at, this, at that one meeting was sounds. This is one thing that a lot of towns don't have in place. And then when you get uses that might have an acoustic guitar outside, if they have a little, you know, um, coffee shop, or they might be, you know, a B and B with wedding venues, and the importance of having sound standards. I know Bolton has them, um, and Bristol Road. <coughs> it's the only two communities that I'm aware of so far. There, I'm sure there's others out there. Um, but we're running into that problem right here in Hudson. We have a small little uh, brewery that went in and can't have any outdoor music, yet they have outdoor tables. Um, and I know Harvard is also, Harvard Mass is also has that issue. They have one of the farms um, that wants to play outdoor music, acoustic, and um, has a lot well, has some water opposition. So the importance of having sound standards. I, I can't stress it enough. Oh, and I had one last one. So Warner, New Hampshire is another community. It's smaller than Hubbardston. It's uh, less than 3,000. It's really done a great job at preserving its historic uh, New England um, character. A couple takeaways. They have uh, many um, overlay districts um, in that small center. Um, but if a commercial use of butts a residential or open space they require require a 25 foot natural vegetative buffer so it's not necessarily a setback but that has to be buffered um i mentioned the overlay district and then the other thing that they have um and we required this in Bolton as well is if you have any formula businesses which is a chain um you have architectural requirements so you have those in place just in case i i don't think hubbardston is you know prone to it but it's great to have it in place to say hey if you have a dunkin donuts in here guess what your sign is going to look like this you're not going to have lighting you're going to have certain colors that are muted so it's just a way of protecting um your community we did that on one bolt and, and warner does have that any questions so far before I move on to the next couple slides, which are just a, a couple? Nope. Not for me. Any other communities that you think I should look at that are missing from here? Well, I thought we might briefly talk about that when you're done. Uh, okay. Yeah. That, let me continue. Then. Okay. Let me continue. And then I'm not going to go into this. This is in that um, that handout, but just, you know, after looking at all of this and analyzing, you know, just what can we do in the town center, you know, are allowing mixed uses, are there other appropriate uses that the town hasn't considered as we're looking at um, these other communities? Um, do, does the town want to expand the town center through the mixed use overlay? Are there, are there other properties um, or other zoning districts that you would want to include in this um and then really looking at the existing uses to see whether or that are appropriate um or other ones that we could add in um and then you know looking at inclusionary housing sound standards set sound um standards design standards um and then that vegetative buffer um, and I think that's all I, and, and just next steps quickly is, you know, working on a draft zoning bylaw and design guidelines, conducting that um, visual preference survey, um, presenting the survey results, the draft design, um, draft zoning and design guidelines to the EDC and planning board sometime October, November, having public engagement, um, and then revising the zoning and getting feedback in December. So this is kind of the flow and, you know, these can move around. We could do the public engagement before, but I think this makes sense. Well, um, you just got to jumpstart on that because. And uh, I think that's have... it. My, um, that's my next slides were for the next one. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions that people have. 
I can stop sharing, um, Christopher, yeah. but I'm not sure if anyone wants me to go back to any of the slides. Yeah, while we're doing questions, can you, uh, I, I think it, oh, just, for, just in the interest of time, can you go through the process to make me host again um, while, we're, while we're fielding questions? So I guess to keep this organized, any questions from the planning board first? A lot to think about. Yeah, there's a ton to think about. <laughs> It's tough to be like, uh, any questions? Yeah, about two hours worth. Exactly. I need to digest sure. it All first. Right. <laughs> and, you know, feel free, um, if you have questions, you can you know, send them to the planning board or the economic development committee, and they can send them to me. Um, I'm happy to compile questions, too, and um, get yeah. back to people as and, well. And just to comment on that, that also goes for any members of the public, if you have any questions about... Yes, uh, that's what either. I meant. If the public yes. has any questions, um, this isn't the only time. We're going to have lots of opportunities, um, but they can email the planning board um, or... Do you have someone yet, the, uh, the planning We have somebody staff? who just started on Tuesday. They're going through huh. training, but uh, they, they'll be available for regular duty next week. All right, excellent. Very and I might about. just add my contact information and possibly that person's contact information to this um, slide okay. so that if people do want to send you know, questions, we can compile those. I have a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, 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 first, I'd, I'd like to know, and thank you very much. That was a great presentation. And <laughs> it's a lot of information. It so. is, but it was great information. Um, can you tell me of the? And I appreciate, you know, I've I've, I've worked with Alice on these uh, uh, peer communities uh, and, and like that, and there were a couple that were uh, that were added, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, can you tell me which of these towns are right to farm communities? Do we know how many of them are? I don't, and that's a really good question. I can tell you Bolton is, okay. because I was the town planner in there, but which communities yes. are right to farm? Okay. Yeah. okay, that's a great question. Okay, and then I, you know, I had emailed you about our, uh, our discussion about in particular, uh, Bristol, Rhode Island, and one in New Hampshire, and if uh, and our feeling that they might not be not not so much suitable, but perhaps there were other communities uh, that we can replace them with. Um, we don't need to go over that now because I know that there's a little crunch in time. Uh, unless anyone else on the committee has anything to say about it, I a couple. Yeah, I, go ahead. I did want to comment on that um, sure. because I, I think it would be nice if we had some examples where um, where the town businesses were more open space recreational use forward. So yeah, I don't exactly. know if that means maybe maybe we look at like East Burke or like one of those places. Um, because of, and I'm sorry, Christopher, you said open space or or recreational rec use forward. Uh, pla okay. Places where where that is a, a major part of their industry or economic development plan. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Specifically, Char Charlemont, uh, Charlemont, Massachusetts, yeah. was another one, and also uh, I think uh, Lindenville, Vermont, and East uh, Burke, Vermont. And, okay. and, and Linden, Lindenville, correct. Vermont. And then okay. also maybe a couple of towns uh, uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, west, towards the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. Just trying to look for towns that might be relatable because of these visual presentations that we're really excited about doing. Yeah, um, yeah. And just feel that we, we, we really want people to look at this. They're gonna be a little bit overwhelmed by some of the statistics, let's say, okay, from the analysis. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and quite frankly, I'm concerned that they might not pay as much attention. But we, if we have some towns that have more relatable things, uh, I think mm -hmm. that that would be a, 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 good, uh, a good thing to accomplish, especially for the visual presentations. Yeah. And are there any other, you know, you, br you brought up one really good thing to look at, which towns are right to farm? Um, Chris, you know, looking at open space and recreational, um, you know, uses or, um, you know, community 
that's a big part of their industry. Are there any other type of uses that you can um, think off the top of your head? Um, well, my notes show that from our last meeting that uh, it was brought up about uh, perhaps needing some other towns that have areas that are also uh, not usable. Mm -hmm. That have restrictions. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 And I'm going to take a minute because Cheryl has been kind enough to take uh, the, the minutes for the meeting. And I just want to give her a moment to catch up and ask her if she has anything that she'd like to ask or say before we move on. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm, I've been um, taking taking notes as best as I can. Um, um, I, well, this is not really coming. This is not really originating from me, but um, I had a conversation with Whitney recently where we were talking about um, the fact that, and I'm new to Hubbardston, but it was a learning moment for me that Hubbardston has a lot of um, residents who are um, in the in the older age brackets. Yes. yes. Um, our, our, our second largest demographic or population is 60 to 69 year olds. That's our second. And then the largest is 50 to 59. So I think that's, that may be something to also look at in terms of peer communities. Um, because if that's something that is, um, you know, taken into consideration, the, the interests of those populations may be may be different and something to, you know, that, 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 um, that informs the conversation around zoning. Yeah, that's, that's okay. very good. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you, Cheryl. Any other comments or thoughts? This is all great feedback. <clears throat> And just for the members of the public present, we are going to do a public comment section on this. That is not tonight, though. So we absolutely right. will be. Everybody's going to have a chance to contribute on that. So uh, just to throw that out there. Any, any other questions from the planning board? Any other questions from the EDC? No, thank you. Not for me. Anything else, Jennifer? No, I think that's all. I think this was really, um, really helpful. I really appreciate the feedback and your time. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming. And once again, sorry for running a little late with you. We're, we're no worries at all. So we uh, we do need to thank close you. Thank the you, Jennifer. Uh, you, thank you. I, I need, need to give this to back to you. Yes. <laughs> so Whitney, if you'd like to... Uh, uh, I guess I could act. I'm on the EDC. I would like to make a motion to uh, adjourn the EDC hearing. Second. Uh, for, for that, you should be calling the vote, Whitney. Vote, please. To adjourn the meeting. Aye. Uh, Monroe, aye. Freiburg, aye. Meeting adjourned at 6.57 p.m. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone on the EDC for joining us, and thank you for your patience, and uh, I'm looking forward to both of those projects moving forward. Great. Do you want me to just shut this down? Or no, I, do I you need you to make you the this... host before you leave, or else you will end the meeting. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, now walk me through this. Yeah, I know you had to <laughs> Uh, so I think I hover over you, right? Yep, you open up participants. Yeah, make and host. Then, yep. yep. I think I just did it. Excellent. You have, you have it back? He does. Yes. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'm going to hang on, Christopher, for a little while. Excellent. Yeah, you're welcome to, uh, to hang around as long as you'd like. Thank you. Thank uh, you, everyone. Appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's see. And uh, joining up for the record, joining us now as a panelist is John Demalia, member of the planning board, uh, who I might have accidentally just bumped out of the meeting. <laughs> but
let me see if I can get him to reach me. Looking forward to when we have a clerk again. So now we have uh, Mr. Damalia joining us. So moving down the agenda, the next thing we have on tap is the continuation of the public hearing for 14 Main Street. Uh, so just to talk a little bit about our, our plan for the evening, I'd like to invite Mr. Parisi up to the table. Uh, I would like to, um, uh, once I reopen the public hearing, I'd like to have a public comment session again for a while. Uh, and then we'll... Uh, And then we'll likely close the uh, the public hearing and enter into deliberation. And let me just look and see how many people we have that want to speak. One, two, three, four, five, ish. So I have well, I have a couple maybes. That's the ish. So let's um, let's do. What time are we at now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are we are at seven o'clock. So let's do, what, is, what would the board, what does the board have any thoughts? 15, 20 minutes, 20 minutes? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Maybe 15 minutes would be three minutes. Yeah, five-ish. Let's. Six times three. Well, there's minutes. the maybes. Yep. Let's do 20 to be safe. Okay. So let, let's shoot for 20 minutes of public comment. So I would like to call back into session the uh, the public hearing uh, for the Hubbardston Planning Board. Uh, we're holding a public hearing that has been continued from August 25th to consider the application for a special permit uh, to construct a cell tower in Hubbardston. The applicant is Vertex Towers LLC. The proposed tower is to be located at address 14 Main Street. Parcel number 08A041 with access to that parcel via 7 Brigham Street, 08A051 and 9 Brigham Street, 08A049. So thank you all for your patience. Uh, we are back into the public hearing on this. And uh, let's... Let's have some public comments. So I guess first uh, we have uh, Mr. Stoll with a maybe. With a maybe. For now, I'll defer to the people that are poor, more uh, directly impacted. Okay. So no questions at this time or no comments. All right, so moving down the list, we have Ms. Lovewell, I think it is. Yep. So Michelle Lovewell, 5 Maple Avenue. I have a letter from a uh, realtor who evaluated my home and said I would like to present it to the board and have it entered in as evidence. Um, basically, anybody who has a cell tower within 2,000 feet of view of their house will see about a 10% loss in home value. I would also like to present pictures of the tree line that in winter time with no leaves so that it's very obvious that you can see everybody in the center of town will have a clear view of the cell tower for at least six to seven months out of the year. That's all I have for right now. I sent a email expressing my concerns about radiation dangers because we are all within 500 meters of this tower. There are several, several um, studies done in other countries, in Brazil, in Spain. They are peer-reviewed, peer-accepted studies. They show that very, very clear findings that cell towers cause cancer. I implore, I sent links, I implore the board to check out those links, to read those studies, so that you understand that not just my house, but every house in the center town district is gonna be in this bubble of extra radiation. 
And this, I just found this out, or I would have been screaming this at the beginning. I just found this out while I'm looking at cell towers and property values. So. Well, thank you for your comment. We did receive your correspondence, and it was entered into the file uh, for this matter, for the record. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parisi, I would prefer if you could keep a running list of concerns <laughs> and respond to them, as opposed to going back and forth every time in order to conserve time. Can I ask uh, a quick question? Yes. Regarding the pictures. The pictures are taken from your from, from your my house, house. From your house, and yes. they're in the direction of the proposed? Yes. Okay. They are right behind the tower. Will be. Uh, I, I get it. Okay. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear as long as I understand what the yes, sir. What, what the purpose is, and not only that, but the direction. Thank you. Yes. Sir. All right. So moving down the list here, uh, Mr. Blanchard. Yeah. Um, the uh, you're going to check at the last meeting with the town <coughs> council to see if you. Uh, needed to, it was advisable to have the site plan completion done prior to issuing a special permit. Uh, do you have any feedback on that? Yes, uh, the board did check with town council and it is permissible to handle them as two separate applications. We do also have a representative from KP Law sitting at the table with us on behalf of our designated town council. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be talking about some of those issues as we go. Yes, uh, please identify Did, yourself. Oh, Justin Parada from KP Law. Nice to meet everyone. Yes, uh, if, um, I don't know if you would like to respond to that, otherwise we can come back to it later. If I understood the question, <coughs> I, I think Carolyn probably responded. Yes, she did. Yeah, you can do it either way. You can do it as one, or, or you could do them separately. Um, so which one would also like the most and protection? And I'm sorry? Which one, would, which one of those two would offer the town the most protection? It, it would be a mechanical or a procedural um, way to approach them, but the, the board is going to have to decide both in any event. But the decisions could be written as one or separately. Thank you. The other is the uh, ZBA rejected the uh, variances. Uh, does the planning board move forward anyway or wait for the appeals to uh, appeal period to expire? We're going to be uh, discussing that in the deliberation <coughs> portion of our meeting. Um, we're going to spend uh, a bit of time on that later on. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could yes. you please speak louder because it's hard hearing you in the back? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, we're going to come back to that later on. Uh, so you're going to leave the public comment, public hearing open so that we have a right to speak? Oh, everyone is welcome to stay. Uh, yeah, I didn't know whether you were going to close the... Uh, I didn't know whether you were going to close the public yeah, comment. Yeah, we, we will close the public comment before we before enter into Before you speak about that issue? Um, does, well, let's ask the, the rest of the board. I personally feel that deliberations will take place after the public comments. Yes. That's why we have an open, that's why we have an open hearing, to listen to what the public has to say. And so at the time of the, and we will take that into consideration and we will discuss this as part of our deliberation, which is the appropriate time for the board at that point in time to present this case and to deliberate. Yep. I guess clarification wise, so does that come after you close the, the public comment section? Yes, it does. Uh, Any further? Uh, uh, there was a, a question regarding the bond, and it was under a one-year review, and the board was going to take a look at that in terms of making sure that uh, that bond would be in place like 25 years down the road, if necessary. Yes, we, uh, we are going to look at that, and uh, we are certainly going to be having a conversation about that with council and with Mr. Murray and the applicant, and we're going to make uh, a decision that in the best interest of the town either way. Thank you. Uh, any, fr any further comments? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, moving down the list, we have uh, Mr. Murray. Just going to respond to comments, that's all. Okay. Well, that's going to save us some time. Uh, we have Mr. Parisi, who we will come back to, and we have a maybe 
Mr. Alphonse. Uh, which I believe actually lines up with Nancy. So. Mr. Alphonse. No, I'm all set right now. Excellent. All right. <coughs> any uh, any further comments or questions? And if anybody has any questions online, uh, please raise your hand or post them in the chat. Members of the public. Do we have any attendees? Uh, we have the only attendee that we have is Tom Johnson, and that's your engineer. He's a civil engineer for Vertex. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> All right, uh, last call for questions or comments. Did you want, uh, I'm sorry, not Mr. Parisi. Uh, I'm okay, thank you. <laughs> um, while, we're, uh, while we're still in public comment, uh, Mr. Parisi, would you like to respond to any of the concerns that were raised? Um, with respect to putting a letter to the realtor, um, I'm not sure that a realtor's opinion is very valuable. Um, um, there's been an equal amount of studies that I'm not going to produce that say that the lack of cell phone coverage affects property values. And, uh, but that's anecdotal, just as any real estate agent's opinions is anecdotal, and if not, very valuable. Can um, I respond to that? Uh, uh, welcome. Uh, um, welcome back to that. Uh, 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 there's oh, also, there's uh, also can you speak up? Yeah, there's also been ample studies, um, including one done by the state of New Hampshire, based on appraised value, which is far more valuable, and data uh, showing after the fact to show that there are no effects on property values uh, based on, on cell towers. And the third thing is, I don't know that that's really a consideration here. That's not a, I mean, when you look at the criteria for a special permit that we're required to obtain, when we're required for the criteria for site plan approval, that's not one of the criteria. And sometimes people write that into certain criteria, but I don't think the town of Hubbardson has. With respect to visibility, I actually am going through your zoning bylaw right now, and I don't see the word invisible at all. Um, it's it's mitigating the visual impacts as much as possible, doing the best we can. Um, you know, we've explained the need for the height, the need for the location, the requirement that the town said go to this um, neighborhood as opposed to any other neighborhood in town. Um, and I think we've done uh, an extraordinary amount to find a location that um, meets the zoning bylaw to mitigate the visual impacts as much as possible. And with respect to radiation, um, we submitted a report as part of the application to show that um, when constructed, the facility will comply and be well under all applicable FCC limits with respect to uh, um, emission exposure, which is really our requirement. Uh, the FCC has done an immense amount of research, there's an immense amount of science out there to show that there is a um, um, no harmful effect. Um, um, the the um, um, other towns have built facilities closer to residential properties on existing structures. Uh, I told you the story of how I was responsible for putting a, uh, a a cell tower in the parking lot of the high school that my children attend to. We have antennas in the church that I sit in every Sunday. Uh, so, you know, there's ample examples. I did a project in Worcester where the Worcester Housing Authority asked us to put antennas on every housing authority building in the city of Worcester because those were the tallest buildings in neighborhoods outside of downtown Worcester. So, uh, um, you know, there's just ample opportunity to show that uh, um, the science shows that there's really no adverse uh, impact on, on, on people as a result. Uh, and I'd also, and I, I don't want to replace your counsel, but uh, Zoning boards are, and planning boards are precluded from considering that because this is really delegated to the jurisdiction of the FCC. Uh, uh, and uh, with res the only other question that came up that I think I need, the, 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 yes, the ZBA denied the variance. We intend to assert all our rights under applicable law, including a constructive grant that the zoning board failed to act within a requisite amount of time. I don't think that has any impact on the planning board decision. I believe. Um, we require the variance. Uh, maybe the uh, planning board thinks otherwise. We've applied for it. We've received it via the doctrine of constructive grant. Um, uh, we intend to appeal the denial, but I think the planning board can um, make a decision 
irrespective of the zoning board's decision so that we can move forward. I, and ma'am, I did promise you uh, an opportunity. I just wanted to say that the federal government has actually not done any kind of tests or studies. Uh, all of these tests have been done in other countries with existing towers near people. They've tested the people who are already living next to towers. There is a Pittsfield, Mass case where the Board of Health just had to serve a cease and desist order to Verizon to take down their tower because they refused because there were plenty of instances of people having sicknesses and being sick and there were documentations and they made them take the tower down because they were sick. This is not a joke. This is not, so I'm so terrified right now because I'm gonna have a freaking tower, right? I'm gonna be the closest to this tower. I'm gonna, we're gonna die of freaking radiation poisoning. We're gonna get cancer. It is clear in those stinking studies. I really wish you guys would read them. The entire center of town is at risk. 1,640 feet worth of distance, what they say is a safe distance to be from. My house is 1,200 feet from this tower. This is terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I can't sleep at night, I can't eat. We're gonna, if I have grandchildren, I cannot let my grandchildren come to my house for fear that they might get something. They might absorb this radiation. This is, this is terrifying. And we have the school right here. Can, can Mr. Parisi do a line from the tower and see how far the school is? Is that outside the 1,640 foot bubble? Are you going to all the kids in the school? Did you know they, they, they absorb radiation at two times the rate as the adults? And the biggest, biggest complaint from people living within 500 meters of the cell tower, anxiety issues, sleeplessness, restlessness, inability to remember things and to focus, irritability. I already suffer from all of these symptoms. Living this close to a cell tower will exacerbate every single last one of them. And anybody else who lives in this 1,640 foot bubble will also be exacerbated by these symptoms. Not to mention the cancer risks. 900% increase in cancers in women. Breast cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer. We're gonna subject these people to this in the center of town. This is what we're gonna give to the center of town. Are we serious? This is killing me. We cannot do this. Sorry. Thank you for your, your public comment there. Um, we're, we're bumping up on the time, so. Because an environmental impact study is required by the special permit process, why wouldn't we, with all of these concerns, why wouldn't we have an independent environmental study done rather than one provided by the applicant? Uh, Mr. Murray, could you help answer? Actually, uh, would you care to answer that question? Um, the town has charged the planning board with making an environmental analysis. We provided Can an you speak amount of, up a little louder, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, uh, the town has charged the planning board with, with making a special permit decision relative to cell towers. It required us to perform an environmental analysis, which we've done. And the criteria really for your environmental impact are um, very predominantly geared towards water protection because this town is a watershed and has a lot of, of wetlands and watersheds and wellheads and things like that. And a facility like this is no more impactful to the environment than any other single family foundation. We're building a small foundation. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that I've, I've explained previously is that um, um, the environmental impacts of cell towers are federally regulated under a big a comprehensive environmental um, regulation called the National Environmental Policy Act. And uh, uh, independent of what we do at the town of Hubbardston or at the Commonwealth of Massachusetts level, we have a very extensive um, environmental impact analysis to perform. And um, we provided that uh, analysis as part of the application package. It's not done yet. 
and the reason it's not done is because um, several of the things require notice of approval of the town. We have to show the exact location that's going to all these different state agencies, and if for some reason the town made us move it for some reason, we'd have to restart that process. So we get town approval, and then we finalize the environmental impact. But we can do a lot of database research to show that there's no environmental impact. And in addition, um, we're required to make sure there's no impact on Native American resources, um, endangered fish and, and uh, wildlife and uh, uh, plant species, and so it's a very comprehensive analysis that we can't finalize until this board finalizes the decision here so that we can finalize that. But uh, again, based on our um, database research, we don't anticipate any environmental impact on any of the, the noted resources. So um, we get a lot more scrutiny than any other development in town because of that. Uh, Mr. Murray, do you care to add, add to that answer at all? As I recall, they, when the initial submittal was made, they said that they would supply the NEPA, National Environmental Policy uh, Protection Act, um, NEPA filing. And a follow-on filing, as I recall, states that a full NEPA was not required and they weren't going to supply it to the town. I do take a little bit of umbrage to say that he cannot provide the information the information can be provided in draft form because it's formulaic. It says, address this, address this, address this, cite your resources, and if you can't address something, then you simply cite the fact that pending further review and approval, but you can certainly provide the town with a NEPA assessment on this current site. And I, I don't agree with the statements that have been made. But we'll, uh certainly put that at the top of the list for deliberations. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've been a radiology tech for 44 years, and I've done, I'm have uh, done. i Dolores Lordway from High Street. Thank you. Um, I, I'm only here because of the concerns that she's presented. There's a lot of discrepancy about, just like vaccine, what's it going to do down the road, and also radiation from, from towers is another issue. So I'm interested about this. That's why I'm here to see. Well, oh, thank you for your comment. We do close discussion. I would entertain a motion. I make a motion that we, because it's been a, we have a lot of deliberation. It's getting late. We've been here. We've heard a lot of this. Uh, that we um, close the public discussion on this issue and begin deliberations. I second that motion. All right. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Hearing no discussion, uh, I'd like to call a vote. Uh, and it is a roll call vote. Vote And uh, Erica, you are voting for this. Erica Dack, aye. Alice Liftall, aye. Thomas Versteiger, aye. Christopher Monroe, aye. John Demelia, aye. All right, so that is closing. And for the record, it is 7.22 p.m. So we're going to have a list of issues to talk through here, um, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to eat the elephants. So for the purpose of guiding a discussion, um, have uh, what has been is a copy for person? Yes, there's a copy for everyone. We have a draft of what a special permit would look like if we were to grant one uh, because it gives us a framework to discuss this with him uh, because it outlines all of the requirements. You have the most recent one, right? Uh, well, I think they're actually, I'll give you the Okay, one yeah, give me the one that you have. And you mind, please don't staple. Okay. Thank you. How many more do we need down there? I think 
think we're all set on this side here. Appreciate everybody's patience through this. I appreciate your clerkship on this one. All right, and on the board side, we have a version that has the comments from town council. So, uh, have an extra one? Yes. Thanks. So, uh, Carolyn was not able to get her comments over to me until later on in the afternoon today. So, I wasn't able to incorporate them into a version, and we, we we're going to have somebody to do that next week. So, what, um, what everybody is looking at here is, as I described, uh, it is what a special permit uh, would look like if we were to grant one. Uh, so what my, uh, my goal here to do is to go down this document uh, and, uh, and mark it up and have discussions on, uh, on items where we believe that's going to happen. And we all know uh, there are a couple session, sections where we're definitely stopping. Uh, we're going to have to have a discussion about <coughs> impact. We're going to have to have a discussion uh, about um, uh, the access. Yep, the access, the runoff, uh, drainage calculations, and there was another one that came up in the public comment specifically that we needed to address. Um, Kind of the health concern. I mean, I think yeah. it's legitimate to yeah, absolutely. try to discuss that. And um, I think the NEPA needs to be also and Phil discussed. Phil has his hand up to yeah, help you out. And Mr. Hey, me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, you haven't authorized me to proceed on any review on this, other than the pre-submission we did. OK, so I guess that. If we're going to start sequentially, can we just ask, I think it was Bill's comment, why this was drafted to include both the site plan review and the special permit, but this says two special permits. Is that an ad that you brought, an addition you brought in? And it why was. I, that thought, I thought we had a, spe a use special permit and a special permit under the wireless fire law. Is there an some to town council some reason I mean, why they couldn't be together if they granted together? Did you think they were two? No. I need a special permit. In addition to the general special permit criteria in your general special permit bylaw, I also need to comply with the special permit in your wireless bylaw. But it's if we same, have... It's the same permit. But we can address them all in one permit. Exactly. Okay, the, so the I question, would say one... The question one is whether or not we could do special permit and site plan review, which is a separate review process, independently, and you can do it together or independently. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, it's two approvals, right? It's the basic special permit criteria and then the wireless. Yeah, I think they're, they're, it's one approval with multiple criteria. Right. Uh, well, I would like to, I don't know whether you suggest or whether you need to move it, but to have this document, which goes through all the criteria for um, the, the, the special permit, the site plan review, the um, um, telecommunications bylaw, and what's the other one? Anyway, it goes through them all. Yeah. So I'd like to have this document, I would like to suggest that this document be um, Again, a proposed draft of granting both the special permit and the site plan review, because that's how it's prepared. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's a 
a use allowed by special permit in the residential district and it is a special permit granted under the wireless bylaw. So there's that wording in the first paragraph that needs to be addressed to grant them both or first. deny them both, but. The citation would be. So, because it addresses Article 7, Special Permits, Article 8, Environmental Community Impact Analysis, Site Plan Approval, and wireless and the Wireless Communication Facility and, uh, Bylaw. So it's the whole. 4.2, Uses by Special Permit in the Residential District, 4.2F. Okay. I didn't think that applied because there's a special bylaw provision, Article 18, right. that applied to us. So the, the general use was overridden by the specific use delineated in the Article 18. Well, all this does is go through special permits. It's a general criteria right, for all I, special permits. You agree I, that would apply? I, 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 Article 7. And then Article 8 is Environmental and Community Impact Analysis, which we, you did address, you answered. Which is tied which in, we that's filed. Correct, yes. Article 9 is Site Plan Approval, which correct. is tied heavily to the plans you submitted. Correct. Right? And then the Wireless Communication Facility, all of those technical things. Correct. So if we granted one one document and addressed all that criteria, it could be comprehensive. That's correct. Okay. That's my point. Yep. So the lead-in sentence should be, again, this is a draft, but it grants both the special permit and the site plan review approval. Right. Sorry, I just... Uh, what was the, the wording there? That's what I can. So it would be grants mm -hmm. in the first line. Humber's and Planning Board hereby grants. A. And not one special permit, but grants. A special The permit. special permit and approves the site plan review. Oh, that's already in here. It's in well, the front I line, think you need the second to line. Two. And Did approves you? the site plan review submitted by the applicant, Vertex Tower. But it's not two special permits. That's correct. It's one special permit. So that's the correction. And somebody had suggested it needed two, and I don't know where that came from. So. Me. Yeah. Are you happy with one now? Uh, I see this two, but I can see the, the, the logic in the one. So your two would be one for? Well, use. It's 4.2F of the zoning bylaw specifically says it's a use by special permit. But if it's a use by special permit and Article 18 says it's a special permit, I. I can clearly see how you can lump it together and say it's the same use described in Article 4.2F and reviewable under Article 18. Okay, and the town council has I, no problem no, with that. One no. document could do yep. both. Yep. All right, I just and it just has the extra criteria that it wouldn't have if it wasn't a wireless. System. Right, but that is addressed in here. Right, no, I'm okay. If you walk yeah, through yeah, it, yeah. okay. Uh, sorry, Christopher. No problem. All right, so, and that's what the first paragraph. The first sentence would look like. Uh, just a couple of typos. The name of the applicant is Vertex Towers with an S, and that kind of you might have to do a global of that. And uh, the um, the name of one of the um, easement holders was spelled wrong. It's Rene R E N E E in the third line. Uh, one more time, please. W E in the third instead line. of uh, double N. Yeah, exactly. R E N E E. Uh, R E N N E. E E N E. No, Renee, R E N E. And then I actually had another question, which was the applicant on the special permit is Vertex. And then the owner, so all technical stuff for you people listening, the owner of the property, the Taylors, is that correct? They, they're, not, they're not co applicants, they're That's just correct. the owners giving permission. But the two, um, the Altos and the Olsons, whose property this crosses over, they are co-applicants. Is that correct? No, I disagree with that. I believe that 
for the purposes of the special permit and site plan approval, the um, the only applicant is Vertex Towers LLC. Okay. Uh, that a little bit different at the zoning board because variances run with the land, and so the property owner needs to sign the application. But the uh, um, the applicant here is just Vertex Towers. Oh. I, I, they they provided us with authorization, but they don't have any you know obligation here other than um, uh, as property owners. Okay, so again, the town council, would you agree then we can cross out and applicants? Yeah, I mean, if they're not on the applicant, right, there's a, there should be an application. Okay, all right, so then we will cross out. We finally have almost the first paragraph. <laughs> Christopher, back to you. Okay, so just to clarify there, that is striking. Uh, oh, the co-applicant language. All of the co-applicants. So it's striking from and all the way through, um, Olson. Olson. Yeah. Anything else on the first sentence? Ne the next. Right. Moving on, there's language that was proposed by council for the following uh, paragraph, which. Uh, uh, did not get incorporated because it came in later on, which is Vertex Tower LLC, Vertex in parentheses, submitted the documents, plans, and photographs listed below in support of its combined application for special permit and site plan review from the planning board and variance from the zoning board of appeals, period. The planning board's consultants, Places Associates, Inc., Parentheses places submitted a completeness review, which is also listed. That is what council proposed as a paragraph for that. Any comments or discussion on that? No. All right, following down is a document list and Council did propose um, additions to that list. So we have um, uh, application for special permit and site plan approval, parentheses planning board, and application for variances, zoning board of appeals, uh, submitted uh, submittal completeness review, Vertex special permit and site plan submittal, 14 Main Street and 9 Brigham Road, Hubbardston, Massachusetts, filed by Places Associates, dated May 18, 2022. Next document is revised application for special permit and site plan approval, uh, parentheses planning board, and application for variances, parentheses zoning board of appeals, for telecommunications facility addressing emissions and deficiencies identified in the above completeness review, filed by Vertex LLC. Uh, undated, filed on or about June 15th, 2022. Uh, then council is added, applicant submitted. Uh, applicant submitted supplement number one to application for SP, planning board parentheses and variances, ZBA containing balloon test Z dated 7-5-2022. Applicant submitted supplement number two, uh, to the application for special permit, planning board, and variance, including drainage summary and revised site plans dated 7 14 2022. And those are recommendations from the council to add to that list. Uh, any additions or discussions on any of those documents or on that list? Mr. Chair? Um, one of the other issues that came up was the decommissioning bond. And you had asked us to provide a, an estimate, a decommissioning plan showing, and I just got that last week prior to the last meeting. I just I emailed it to you today. I have paper copies right here, but I call that supplement number three with the removal cost estimate. And uh, so I'm sure it will come up during your deliberations, but you might want to add it to the list under the documents, correct? Exactly. And I'm sorry, you're calling, can we have a quick, yeah, quick uh, check on this yeah, here? I, I, there's like five copies there. Oh, that's okay. For us, it's just to make sure that we have this here. Exactly. So this is good. This 
the supplement number three? Yes, exactly. copies? Absolutely, yes. Oh, okay. there's I'm one sorry, I thought you, this was a... Yeah, I think there's five or six copies there, so I, I, just three pages. Oh, thank you. So we'll, we'll take this here. Okay. Thank you. And again, this is estimate from uh, Proterra? Yeah, the civil engineer, um, to dovetail with the removal cost. And I'm assuming um, these, this entity, Proterra, has done this here? Before? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They're 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 not affiliated with Proterra. We engage. I mean, with Vertex, we engage them to do engineering and construction management, and uh, uh, um, and it's all based on engineering standards for uh, uh, for the cost of. Uh, there's like books that tell them how to uh, um, estimate the cost of removal. So basically, for people out there that don't you have a copy, this has, says it would cost you $38,818.19 to take down this tower at the end in today's dollars. That's correct. Okay. And it is signed and stamped by a professional engineer. Correct. So now do we have all the documents? That's, the, I mean, a big part of this is just organization, you know, what do we, what's been submitted here? No. So that is the, uh, well, that's the applications and supplements. There's also the list of uh, other documents that we're about to get to. Uh, any, anything else on the major documents? Just a general comment, Mr. Chair, uh, and that is, is that I, I know we're working with two versions of the document, one which was provided to you by council, the other one which is the one we are working with. I will mention the fact that was a number of spell checking errors that uh, were caught and updated in the in this version of the document and I'm just showing you at this point in time which one I'm talking about whereas they have not been incorporated in this year so we'll yes. just have to reconcile those two Thank you, Mr. Steiger uh, moving on to the next list of documents we have documents included and in above revised Applications include 300 foot abutters list report and map showing locations of these properties, application for special tournament, planning board form, application for public hearing before a zoning board of appeals, uh, parentheses, zoning board of appeals, application form one, close parentheses, four, application for site plan approval, uh, parentheses, planning board form, close parentheses, five, Application for special permit and site plan approval, parentheses, planning board, uh, close parentheses, and application for variances, parentheses, zoning board of appeals, close parentheses, for telecommunications facilities, as revised, including, that is, that is a hanging colon there. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. Oh. Um, I would suggest that number five, go at the top because and not as a um, numbered item because numbers one two and whatever are part of that so they would follow that hanging column that, do that, that, these yeah. are the these were just ordered in the list they were presented in your filing is how it got to be this list but he's right um, right and I, and I think you know um, um, but number five is like the cover page. Yeah, that's and, then, and then one, two, and three are all the things. Um, I do agree with that observation. So you just take out the five and just make it part of the heading. Exactly. That's fine. What I wanted to do in trying to put this together was to make sure we weren't missing things, that we had a list of all of these, and to Put the people on that are looking at this. Um, remind them of the submittal requirements. You know, 
what was required. So we have letters of authorization from the landowners, we have deeds from the landowners, we have um, a, a letter from AT&T regarding uh, their use of the tower, and then narratives describing, you know, m meeting the, so when we refer to some of our decisions, we have where those documents, where that information came from, you can cross-reference it back. couple of minor comments. I agree with all of that. Um, under number 16, you have subsections A, B, and C, and then number 17. But 17 is really part of 16. So rather than having the numbers 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, I would continue D, E, F, G, and H, because um, that's all part of the project narrative. You include it 21, 20, which is the summary? Or just the, summary the, summary is part, the, the summary is part of the project narrative. It's the last page of the project narrative. Oh, so, okay. so basically everything, including 21, becomes the sub-bullet items of 16, and then sub-bulleting thereafter. That's correct. Okay. So all, are, are you suggesting that? Is D, 17 becomes D, 18 becomes E, 19 becomes F, yes. 20 becomes G, yep. 21 becomes H, right? Correct. Okay. And then we go back to numbering? Exactly, yes. So this now becomes the 17 again. So 21, 22 becomes 17, etc. Except that we've, you know, it's actually 21 because we're taking out 5. Right? Yeah, we'll have to do the renumbering. It's, it's all right. It's, it's all right. going to have to be renumbered afterwards anyway. But then we come down to the, the documents that we're not that were in support of the application. One is... Well then, I know I would keep number 22 as renumbered, number 23 as renumbered, and then what you previously had, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28, they would be A, B, C, D, and E under what was previously number 23. Because uh, there's, like, when Don't I submitted, if you look at the cover of my application, okay. I didn't itemize those things out. Those were just attachments to it. Okay, so what we have is 21 is independent. It's the, the letter from the FHA saying yeah, you, the that's tower correct. That's correct. will not require a light on the top because it's far enough from Gardner Airport, right? That's correct. And then 22 is the, um, the engineer, Brendan McGill. That's correct. Who, and his, in his supporting documents, which address the cell cover gaps, yep. the map that he supported before and after he had the tower. Nope, nope, nope. Um, nope. And Brendan Gill gave you, it's, you have it as form number 24, number 25, number 26, number 27, and number 28. Okay, and it? Like, uh, it's the, the site number VTMA, oh, okay. VTMA, alternative site analysis, VTMA, and VTMA. That's just our site number. So 26 should be right. under here as well. Yep. And, then and, 20, and 27 and 28, yes. And 28. That's correct. Okay, and those were the overview maps. And then number 29 is another document. And then the overview maps are subsets of 29, so those should be A, B, and C. Okay, so the okay, so 29, which won't be 29 anymore, will have a exactly, number. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's the radio frequency engineers, and that's yes. where the maps came in showing yes. the proposed, the existing and proposed. Coverage and just for the to be a sequential, I would put existing first, proposed next, and then we get a third map of the existing plus proposed. That's a, okay. So then that has 33 as number 20? Um, yep. I don't know where your citing numbers are, but um, that word site that was floating there on number yep. 32. That's actually the first word of what was Form 33. It's called the Site Emissions Report. Oh, okay. So really, 32 and 33 merge and become number 20. No. 
Um, 33 is a standalone document. Oh, okay. okay, so oh, McGill, no. Brendan McGill's no. study was the studies of all the potential cell tower type sites in the town center district. Exactly. There were five, there was four maps and an analysis. Okay, and his, in, all right, and then, okay, then the radio frequency engineer is the coverage yes. before and after. All right, so that yeah. makes sense. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. So then that puts us, what, what number is 34? Then? 34 is the removal bond that he's right. just submitted something in addition for, right? No. Uh, no, no, that's well, a bond. Actually, that's to support um, that. Right. Um, the removal bond, and that no, former number 35 is just a signature on the removal bond. I, you don't really need to itemize it out, but if you want to, I would put that under what was 34. So then that, uh, well, that the question is still hanging. So what what does that have? What number are we at at 34 then? You're combining 34 and 35, and you're combining 32 and 33 into C, right? C under. Either way. Under what is 29? But 29 is. Concerns on that section? The list of documents. So then the environmental impact analysis is separate, separate item, no subheadings, and the NEP land use screening checklist. Yes, and that actually was provided as an attachment to the environmental and community impact analysis. Okay, so, so it I should be including. Exactly. And then there's the drainage calculation study. Correct. Okay. okay. Any anything else on that section? All right. So plans. We have the compound plan and. Elevation, uh, and two, partial site plan, three, driveway plan and profile, four, uh, details, five, tenant details, and six, erosion and, and control plan and details. Any comments on that section? Those were the initial plans in his book mm -hmm. submitted. Mm -hmm. But there's also been, been up, has there been another? plan submitted with respect to the uh, we submitted revised plans in response to comments from the uh, consultants. Are they the same set of plans they're with revisions of, on them? No, they're the same numbers, same they were just revisions to the plan sheets. All six. Did you provide revisions to all six or mm -hmm. um, just looking at what okay. just curious. Um, so we should say as dated and then comma on for revised. Uh, agreed. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Do you know the original submission date? I'm going to just give you the revised date because that's the final date. And, uh, and so, I believe the revised date is 7 12 22. That is correct. And do you know what the original submission and date Just as far as um, just as far as the plans listed, um, there's a drawing index on the title sheet of the plan set that um, that lists out the different drawings. I think the original set was dated 3-18-22, and the 
uh, revised set was 7 12 22. Okay, well, we can we can put two. Who are we speaking to? That was Tom, that's the engineer who prepared the drawings. Well, so so you want to put uh, plans in, um, including or uh, plans as shown on the drawing index title sheet? That'd be a good way to handle it. And as revised through yeah. 7 12 2022. So assuming, I'm assuming the planning board actually has the original set, or did you submit full size revisions, or was it, how was that handled? Um, I don't know that the planning board ever asked me for full size, we just gave the 11 by 17s. For the revi revised ones? Yes. If we had somebody in the office, we definitely would have asked for the full I mean, size this, this is the problem that yeah. <laughs> we're trying to point out with just getting organized. It's just tremendously difficult. Okay, fine. As revised, we have it. As long as we have the revised ones. Do you have full size handy? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it was just, I, we don't have full size. Okay. That that we have the 11 by 17s. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. we need to have one to put with this, I think. The full size? No, no, one no. of those. So we know what we're talking about. All right. Okay. Further discussion on the section? No. Moving down, photographs. Photographs of a balloon test conducted from the proposed cell tower site and map of viewpoints the photos were taken from. Do you want to date that? Yes. Uh, what was the, the date of that? It just came out like the day before the actual balloon test. So I do have the balloon test the date in here. Photo, the pictures were taken on 6-7. The sims were created on 6-9. And Bill's map was created probably 6-5. It was the day before. And it was at 12 viewpoints? I think it was. Okay. All right. All right. Any further comment mm -hmm. on that section? All right. Applicable zoning bylaws. The following provisions of the Hubbardston zoning bylaw apply to this project. Mm -hmm. Article 7, special permits. Article 8, environment and community impact analysis. Article 9, site plan approval. Article 18, wireless communication facility. I still think you need to put Article 4 uses. We do, we don't. I think you do need to include Article 4 uses. Okay. It's a use listed by allowed by special permit under Article 4. Makes sense to me, Council. So that's the table? Or for the table? Uh, yeah, for all intents and purposes, what yeah. the town calls the table. Okay. <laughs> use regulation. Gotcha. And that 4.2 F. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think it's certainly applicable. There's nothing to be decided. There's no criteria under that. It's basically okay. what most towns call their But they're regulated under it. Under the other ones, yeah. So that makes sense to me. All right, so. Summary of facts. Uh, there is a widely recognized need for improved cell phone service in Hubbardston, as indicated by numerous dead spots and dropped calls. There are presently no cell towers in Hubbardston. Uh, limited cellular broadband access has been listed as a major concern of town residents in several surveys, including a recent survey conducted for the town master plan. In its application, Vertex stated that 95% of Americans own cell phones, 50% of American households now only have wireless phones, and 70% of 911 calls are made from cell phones. And that is consistent with the council. Let's check here. All right, so 
Article 18 has suggestions from Council, and the paragraph suggested by Council reads, Article 18, Wireless Communication Facility of the Hudson's uh, Hubbardston Zoning Bylaws, was adopted at town meeting on February 12th, 2002. Parenthesis amended June 18th, 2002. Comma, June 2nd, 2015, and June 5th, 2018, and parentheses. The bylaw creates a zoning overlay district in which cell towers may be located by special permit with site plan approval. The overlay district includes all land in the town center district and several other individually listed parcels in town, but does not include parcels located off Brigham Street identified to provide access to the proposed tower. Vertex stated in submitted uh, supporting documentation showing that the best location for a cell tower in Hubbardston is the town center district due to the location, topography, and proximity to surrounding cell towers located outside of Hubbardston. The cell tower site proposed by Vertex is in an undeveloped area surrounded by wetlands, farm fields, and Department of Conservation and Recreation parentheses, DCR, land, on top of a wooded hill. The location is approximately 1,000 feet back from Main Street, Route 68, and also 1,000 feet plus back from Brigham Street, the two roads that cross the main intersection in town. There are no other public streets within 1,000 feet of the site. The character of the town center has not significantly changed since the passage of the wireless communication facility by law in 2002. Comments from the board, applicant, council, or Mr. Murray. Yep. My, my only, the only comment with the, uh, that the character hasn't changed significantly is because it's such a big gap since when it was passed. It's like, because there's been a lot of development in that area, so it seemed like a reasonable uh, fact. Anyway, that's it. And I think the town council's comments are good. All right, Vertex proposes to construct a 149-foot tall lattice-style cell tower at 14 Main Street, parenthesis, assessor's parcel 8A-41, close parenthesis, to accommodate four major cell phone service providers. This lot is located entirely within the town center district. It is a long, narrow 13-acre uh, council recommends using a protected lot with only 101.64 feet of frontage on Main Street. The single family house on the lot is close to the street. The tower site is at the rear of the lot over 1,100 feet from the house. Access to the cell tower site from Main Street is not reasonably developable due to steep grades and an extensive wetland in the middle of this lot. Comments from the board, Councilor mm -hmm. Mr. Murray. Comments from the applicant? Nope. Um, moving down here, Vertex proposes to access the tower site through an abutting farm property located at 9 Brigham Street, parenthesis, assessor's parcel 8A-49, close parenthesis, and a small portion of the frontage on 7 Brigham, uh, parenthesis, assessor's parcel 8A-51, close parenthesis, both of these parcels are located within the Residential Agricultural Zoning District. This large parcel consists of 87 acres on which is located a single family house, farm buildings, and farm fields. Access to the cell tower would be over a long existing <coughs> farm lane running from Brigham Street to the back lot line, a portion of which for many years served as the owner's driveway and access for farm vehicles to the fields behind the house. With some upgrades, it can accommodate construction vehicles to build the cell tower and follow on service needed for routine maintenance of the telecommunications equipment. Vertex estimated that the four cell phone companies would service their equipment less than once a month. The rebuilt gravel lane would continue to be used by the landowner for farm vehicles. The public would have no access to the gravel lane or to the property. The access lane would be plowed by the applicant or its assigned 
as is necessary to gain access to the, and there's a typo there, tower, the tower in the winter months. Comments from the board council, Mr. Murray. I have two comments. Yes. One, um, and this is kind of a common theme, you use the word farm lane, and I would call it a driveway. I'm not sure if a lane has any legal connotation, but it's really a driveway, and I'd be afraid to call it a lane to make it imply that it's public. Uh, and then the other issue is, um, um, so that appears three or four or five times in this. Um, um, the, uh, uh, the last sentence that says the access lane driveway would be plowed, it was actually would not be plowed by the applicant or its signs, except as is necessary. So the uh, oh, the problem, uh, Mr. Devalier, you are not on mutes. Um, the 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 farmland's recommendation from uh, I believe council had recommended that there that, that word lane. Yes. No. Did she? Or was that? I don't, I don't think, think so. so. Oh, it mm -hmm. was. Okay. You can make it driveway. Yeah. I mean, I. I, think. I, I I've never seen the word lane get confused with any rights in the general public, but I don't think, you know, I think either one would be suitable. Drive, driveway, lane. The problem I have is that it's a driveway as it gets to the house, and then it stops its dirt from that point forward. It's compacted dirt. And I don't, and I'm sure we'll get into this conversation later on, but it's a, dri a gravel paved driveway for the first maybe 150 feet. And from there on in, it's compacted dirt and there is a clear distinction for me uh, between gravel and pavement and dirt and I'll explain that later on. Okay. I, I agree with that and I think that would come up in the next paragraph. I, I think that distinction comes up in the next so I, you know, how you phrase it, I just wanted to clarify the distinction. So you want the last sentence to read, the access lane would not be plowed by the applicant except as needed. Except as is necessary to gain Except as is needed. necessary. You want to call it, you don't want to use the word lane anymore, right? Right, we're going to use driveway, driveway. right? Is yep. that what you want? Drive? Or? Drive. Drive. Okay. Driveway, he says. I thought I heard somebody say Mr. Chairman while I was writing. I just asked a procedural question. Yes. Um, because we're all here listening to you go through this and it's going to be rather lengthy, are you going to uh, then come back with a final draft that you're going to vote on or do you plan on voting for it tonight? Uh, I don't actually know where we're going to end up on it tonight, but we will uh, put on online any documents that we consider or come out of this except for the ones with comments from council. So do you suggest we should sit here through the remainder? Uh, well, that is a decision for you to make. Uh, I am uh, I am here for the long haul. So. It is videotaped, correct? And it is videotaped. Mm -hmm. I watch these things when I can't attend. I watch them on the videotape YouTube. You go to the home page of the website and it says meeting videos. Yeah. Um, I, from no, a procedural so standpoint, I don't know if we all survive going all the way through the document uh, because we're up, we are going to have some deep discussions about this. Maybe it gets pushed over to another meeting. Maybe somebody motions to adjourn. I, I don't know how that's going to turn out. So I can't tell you concretely one way or another. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Any other comments on that section? No. Right. Moving on to the next paragraph. To accommodate the construction and service vehicles, Vertex proposes to upgrade to uh, proposes to upgrade to that should be proposes the upgrade a or the to to upgrade the yeah. Yeah. and then you're just going to put the driveway upgrade yeah we don't need it all 
To accommodate the construction and service vehicles, Vertex proposes to upgrade the driveway entrance and gravel lane, but not change its location or character. The upgrades require small easements from... Small is trigger out. Require easements. Thank you, Francois. This is... Uh, easements from its one abutter. Is it easements from one or two abutters? Two abutters. No, it's two abutters. It is two. And we provide them. Yeah. And Mr. Murray's not on this head over there, too. To All right. But uh, I said two abutters to the farm property. One is the farm property, right? And then there's the neighbor, the Olsons, on the other side, right? Uh, yeah, it would it take out to the subject property. It, it's not to the farm property, it's to the subject property. Yeah. Okay. Subject to the subject property. Okay, which have been secured, right? Yes. Vertex provided a site plan, detailed drawings of the existing driveway. Driveway. And proposed upgrades. The planning board required a drainage calculation study to show that the runoff from the gravel lane and construction site would not adversely affect the neighboring properties or add additional runoff flows onto Brigham Street located at the bottom of the hill. I'm gonna make that driveway instead of gravel lane. Exactly. So we can discuss that or we can keep on going with facts. Well, let's, uh, let's discuss it. So ultimately our biggest concern is uh, we have had some residents express concerns about runoff uh, uh, changing the water situation entering their property, specifically the board uh, and our consultant have been concerned about additional flow onto Brigham Road because it is an area that's known to have icing problems in the winter. So that's ultimately what's been driving our concern there. Um, so where are we at with the drainage calculation and where are we at with our satisfaction to? Let's, uh, let's discuss it. Uh, Mr. Murray, do you we, care to comment on that? You have not authorized us to move forward with any kind of review, so we have not reviewed the drainage calculations. Um, it's my understanding that the conclusion of those was it was known a technical phrase as de minimis, which is a increase that is uh, relatively insignificant and not within reasonable margins to um, do an analysis on. We use the phrase every now and then ourselves, um, but we haven't reviewed it. And I don't know what the answer to the question is, whether we agree with de minimis or not. I'm concerned that the applicant's engineer modeled the, the existing farm path as gravel and then said, oh, well, we're putting a new gravel path on top of a gravel path. Well, gravel has almost as much runoff as a paved surface. Not as much, but almost. But a farm path has nothing like the same runoff as a gravel or a paved path. And this thing just shoots pretty much down the hill. It's got what we call a bleeder. It discharges some of the water elsewhere. But have, not having reviewed the, the drainage calculations, we're not, we don't have any position to say whether they are or not impacting Brigham Street. So as you know, there are two catch basins there at Brigham Street. And I went with the applicant's engineer and we actually looked down those and they're silted up, they're not in full functioning condition, they need to be cleaned. Um, and I asked the applicant's engineer to reach out to the highway, uh, the DPW superintendent, to talk about what the impacts to these uh, catch basins would be. So I asked him that during the balloon test. Um, I don't know if that was addressed. So uh, I'll obviously let the rest of the board speak on, on this issue, but we, we would like to have those drainage calculations reviewed by our engineer and we obviously, excuse me, by our consultant, and we obviously expect uh, that review is paid for in, in compliance with our special permit rules. Um, 
I, I believe there might be some appetite on the board to potentially do something contingent to that, and I think we can talk about that as we develop here, but I'll let the, uh, the rest of the board chime in uh, on that. We seem to, I mean, one of the central problems, we've had so much trouble moving this forward is because of the disagreement. One of the reasons why we're debating periods and comments tonight is because we don't have any agreement regarding any kind of review fee. But I have to say, while planning board members like myself can try to connect the dots and put together work and draft, I cannot read drainage calculations. So there has to be an agreement reached between you gentlemen to have somebody review those calculations and tell us, because we don't know. I'm a 53 G employee of the board. Absolutely. So. I don't need an agreement with Mr. Place. I need an agreement with the, or Mr. Uh, Morgan, I'm sorry. Uh, I need an agreement with the board. We agreed that drainage calculations were necessary. We provided those drainage calculations. I agree that no one on the board is capable of looking at them. I'm not capable of looking at them. I just forward them along. And I agree that um, uh, Mr. Murray's firm is probably the best one to review that. And if we got a, a, a quote for that and it's reasonable, we'll certainly agree to that. Uh, uh, and we've said that all along. Uh, um, we, we sir, and I, uh, we understand Mr. Murray's concerns. He made them very clear at the, the site walk. Um, I think our engineers have addressed them. Uh, but and there might be some dialogue to uh, to respond to that. Uh, so give us a, a a fee that is reasonable, and we'll agree to pay it, and we'll move on. And I think the whole contingent part of that is appropriate uh, because. Uh, 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 you know, every time we talk about fees, it goes up, not down. And uh, we haven't even gotten to the, the um, unnamed fees in red that showed up today. Uh, uh, so uh, give us a number. We can agree to it if it's reasonable, and then we'll move on. But it, it's, it's like it's open-ended. And um, Bill, you want to create a list of the documents that are arising tonight? I mean, you, you must review drainage calculations fairly often, right? Very often. And then the other issues that are coming up, and maybe maybe before we leave tonight, because this is where this got dropped, and then nothing happened, and now we're up against this shot clock. And it's putting us in this painful position of having to do this stuff we should that should have. Anyway. If we can get to that, an agreement on what that would cost to wrap up your questions and an agreement that if the plan isn't good enough and he needs changes to it, what that might cost, and let's start over here and see if we can, what do you think? That's my two cents here. Uh, ideally, that's where, where we need to end up. And we, we need to leave this room knowing how this is going to be resolved. That's why the town is currently spending quite a bit of money for this meeting because we have council sitting here and for this particular moment um, I have uh, I have clearly stated that the planning board will pay for Mr. Murray's time for tonight. Um, I want us to be sure to get to a conclusion. I think to Alice's point, uh, perhaps having a punch list so we can have a define a, a tighter ask for places associates. Uh, in order to come up with a, a proposal based upon that might make sense. I does, completely agree with that, yes. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Murray? Sure. Time is of the essence um, for me. Uh, we've now entered a period of time where my firm is multiple overlapping deadlines, and I'm, you know, if they get it to me, I am not going to turn it around in 48 hours. Um, there has to be a reasonable time for them to provide the information to me, a reasonable time for me to review it, and an anticipation that there'll be some communication between me and Attorney Parisi or a civil engineer prior to the next meeting. I, I think we can all commit to that, hopefully. Is part this of your discussion Tom, tonight. Can I add a couple of thoughts to that? This is Tom Johnson uh, with the yes. Care Design Online. Um, there was, a, there was a few questions raised regarding the content of those drainage calcs 
And, and those were things that were actually discussed. We had an opportunity to, to, to meet during that site walk, and those were items that were raised and were addressed in the drainage design, and including the concern about um, you know runoff to the street. So we we have had one round of go around here with concerns, and then we've incorporated those into. It. So I, I I'm hopeful that there is you know there may be some review comments, but I'm hopeful that we've already had a chance to identify and address the issues that were that were brought up. So and, and specific to the question about um, dirt versus gravel, we've, we've modeled it appropriately as to what's there. We know that it's a, um, it's a hay field that gets driven on. Um, and we've modeled the existing and proposed conditions consistent with that. We've also put um, added uh, additional stormwater features based upon that to account for it. Uh, and then we've run the calculations to show the change in it. And we've, we've designed the features to accommodate those changes. So. I'm confident that what we've put forward is pretty thorough. It's uh, it's a it's a gravel driveway similar to uh, any house in town, but significantly more uh, robust. So, yeah. well, thank you for that uh, for that clarification. So, so I'll be re reviewing not only the drainage calculations but the revised plan, right? And the, the, yeah, the, the drainage features are incorporated into the revised site plans, um, and, and they go hand in hand. Yeah, they do. the review one complements the other, ideally. And the only thing I'm going to say is, uh, if there's any discussion regarding drainage calculations, don't get me involved. Uh, you, can, you can communicate directly with the engineer, and I'm sure you'll work them out. Uh, so I have your permission on the record to contact your engineer directly. 100 percent directly, yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any any further discussion on that paragraph or on drainage calculations in general? I'm happy to hear we're making some progress on getting some of this review cleaned up. Um, anything else? Next All right, moving forward. A balloon test, as required under the Wireless Communication Facility Bylaw, was conducted on June 7, 2022, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. following mailed notice to all town residents. Photographs were taken by a Vertex agent from 12 well known viewpoints in the town, which were selected by the planning board's agent places as public places from which the tower might detract from the view. The photos enhanced by Vertex super, uh, super imposing a new tower image to scale over the balloon image in the photos. In most of the photos, the balloon was not visible. In others, it appeared small and distant. The enhanced photos and a map of the locations were taken or posted, uh, were taken from, were posted on the Hubbardston Zoning Board website and reviewed at the public hearing. The Vertex application and site plan were reviewed for completeness by places. On May 18, 2022, places concluded that... Uh, this is not exactly... Sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there because of the conversation going on in the room. Uh, on May 18, 2022, places concluded that the application was incomplete and requested revisions and additional information. Vertex responded with an amended application and additional information. Places reviewed the new material, told the planning board that the application was substantially complete, and the board accepted the application at its May 26, 20, uh, 2022 meeting and scheduled a public hearing for June 7, 2022. Is that I believe that's July. Yeah, no, it's... It, I think Carolyn might have caught that in the next paragraph. Yeah. And then the next sentence is July as well. Yeah, so that that was actually July twenty first when the public. That's the public hearing between no. with the planning when board and the GBA was the twenty first. That was July seventh. No, that was. July 7th. Yeah. It was the completeness <clears throat> review on May twenty sixth. Right, and then we scheduled the joint public hearing on July seventh. July, it has to be July. It wouldn't have been July, enough. Yeah, July twenty first. Yeah, but say it's definitely. She's got July twenty first, yeah. so I. Usually pretty thorough. So. so July 21st was the first public hearing date? Is that right? No. The public hearing was held by the application on July 7th. Let me just check that. I have We're this. checking the website. 
that that can't be right. Oh, maybe it could be because maybe yeah, maybe I'll go backwards on this here. So, but maybe Mallory held the date. So did we publish ahead of time on that or something? Otherwise, there wouldn't have been enough time between May 26th and June 7th to publish. Oh, it, it definitely was in July. I it's think we're just between was... July 7th and July 21st. Is yeah. It? Okay. Oh. She has in her timeline the joint hearing was open July 21st. I did that PowerPoint and then always I always put the dates in. So we have we have the public hearing into the CBA, which is scheduled on seven twenty one. Okay. Uh, I'm, you're exactly right. Seven twenty one. Seven twenty one. So on seven seven, we did not have a public hearing. That's correct. No. Okay. It's July twenty one in both of those places. The sentence ending of the last sentence of the paragraph and the. Oh, that was our first public hearing. Yeah, this helped. Okay. So another question is, it says Vertex responded with an amended application and revised plans, right? Is that when you submitted this revised plan? Yes. Okay, so that needs to be added. Okay. Following publication, a public hearing was held on the Vertex application on July 21st, following publication and notice to abutters. The public hearing was continued to July. It was no. not continued to July 21st because that was when it happened. To August 4th. It was actually to August 4th. August yeah. 25th and to now tonight. August 4th. It was the 4th and the 25th. <coughs> Let me double check on this here. August 4th was the planning board meeting that we had and during which we had believed that the uh, just consulting the agenda. Uh, section in our discussion and add in this proposed note. Because we did not have it at one of our meetings nope, because we did not. not we the, had not a special not, permit quorum. Not, not the fourth. Okay. So not the fourth. So it August. was actually on the 721 was continued to 825. Yeah. So August 25th yeah, and yeah, August 25th is when we had it. Yep. Yeah, and September 7th, 2022. Tonight. Uh, is that right? We've only had the three yeah. Yes. Okay. And I was not present earlier, so I do know that on the 25th I was present. I came back here. Continuation of the public hearing. Okay. So it's August 25th, September 7th, and July 21st. All right. Hubbardston residents spoke at each of these meetings and submitted letters and comments for and against the proposal, with all but one acknowledging the. Yeah, I want to take that out. The oh, last yeah. phrase. Striking. I liked it. Yeah, but. I know, I'm only getting... It's got way too many public comments to keep track I, I, of now. I so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that moves us into issues and waivers. During the application process, a number of issues arose that required resolution in order to proceed. Below is a list of some of those issues and proposed resolutions. <laughs> Light at top. One issue was whether the tower would have to be lit at the top at night for aviation purposes. Vertex provided a letter from FAA regulators, listed above, stating that a light was not required and agreed that would, there would be no light unless aviation regulations change to require one. Correct. Okay, just a clarification, it's not a letter from AVA. Um, we um, provided a database search. TOAIR is a database search showing okay. that there's no lighting. And primarily because you're not within a certain distance of an airport, if exactly. I recall correctly. Exactly. Okay, so you would say a database search? Or just say a, a TOWAIR, T O W A I R. T O W. Database search. List them up. Okay. Anything else on that? A database search. It wasn't from the regulators then, it was from your folks, right? It, it, well, it's it's from, it's an FAA and FCC database, but they, uh, okay. we, we have in coordinates and height, and they um, say nothing is required. Yeah, that's the uh, tow, air, right? tow air determination results. Exactly. But the, who did that, who did the, that come from? from the, uh, the FAA and the FCC. Directly. And you provided it to us. Yeah, exactly. Right. We go on the FAA and FCC database to, uh, uh, and entering coordinates and they say nothing is required or more studies is required. Okay, so if you could say a database search, T-O-W-A-I-R, 
yes. stating that light was not required that light was not required right. you don't need to state it's the FCC or the FAA the tollway is the main that identifies it in the industry right exactly. yeah okay. search results right because that's really what you provide was that search results yeah exactly it's not the search itself necessarily okay that sense. Anything else on that one? No. Nope. Uh, monopole requirement waiver. Sure that. Uh, so, Vertex proposes a lattice tower, section eighteen dot four dot one parentheses added to Article eighteen wireless communication <coughs> facility bylaw in twenty fifteen. Close parenthesis, explicitly allows new construction of both monopole and lattice type towers. The amendment appears to conflict with subsection 18.4.2.c dating from 2002, which allows only monopoles unless the tower is attached to an existing structure. The apparent conflict was pointed out by Vertex. Vertex uh, now this is a this place is wrong. where this is wrong. Yeah, we're taking that out. Yeah, I don't believe this is correct. Vertex stated is now industry standard or something. Like that. Vert, yeah, I think if you take out the last half of that sentence, so Vertex stated it is now it is missing industry standard. Yes. Oh, oh, Vertex yes. has uh, lattice towers are now industry standard. standard as it allows for future upgrades and flexibility of meeting wireless companies varying criteria. The planning board acknowledged the apparent inconsistency uh, and agreed to grant a waiver of 18.4.2.c to the extent required so that Vertex could construct a freestanding lattice tower. Okay so also um, this red the red or, or it isn't read on this. No, but this line, that. second to the end on page five, this phrase, suggesting without, what does this mean? Just cross that out. So yes. Yeah. With okay. Okay. Right. what does this mean? That is yeah. crossed out. Yeah, it yeah. is crossed out. It right. is okay. as, as okay. I read it to the record. Okay, yep. So mm -hmm. that's, is that correct statement from you? Your company, actually, the company still will do yeah, monopole I, towers, but it's not the standard. I was going to object to the word only constructed. Um, but you modified the sentence so and now it's right correct. okay the only other question I have is it says that you agreed to grant a waiver yeah well at the end we grant it yeah we this is, this is my summary of facts right <laughs> All right. we can so check uh, check make sure it's there we, we are saying if we uh, assuming we we, we make it through all of well, these so that you we would be granting that waiver you, as this part is I mean, I was going to say, if you did it, put a date in there. But if you're doing it in this document, then I think you need to say agrees instead of agreed. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. You're right. Uh, anything from Council on Mr. Murray? No, I agree. Maybe. If there's a waiver, there's a waiver. Yeah. I, think it's I know you do it in the document, so I just I didn't want to make it imply that you did it previously. Fencing and camouflage waivers. Vertex also requested a waiver of provision 18.4.1.c requiring camouflage and artificial screening and 18.5.2.d parenthesis requiring eight foot high stockade fencing and parentheses due to the tower's proposed location in a densely wooded area far from residences. Vertex instead proposes to secure the cell tower with chain link fencing topped with barbed wire for security. The planning board that would change to agrees. Okay. So we all go forward to these waivers. Now can you put in six fence, six foot chain fence? That's right, right? It's going to be six foot. It's a six foot chain link fence topped okay. with barbed wire. So yeah, six, six foot. I don't have that in there. Six foot. Yes. And, the, yes. the and you did agree fencing. to a barbed wire. Correct. Okay, because I, I, for some reason, I thought it was not going to include a barbed wire. Thank you for clarifying that. So just to clarify, uh, so it's six foot. Is it six foot with two feet of barbed wire? So it's it's six a total foot height of eight plus feet. Plus top with barbed wire. Because four feet with a little bit of barbed wire on top of it would be 
pretty. No, it, it's, it's 76 feet plus barbed wire. I just okay. don't know if the, the barbed wire is two feet or. So, so you, what's the barbed wire on top of the six foot? It, it doesn't. It's three strands at a 45 degree angle. So it's about a foot. But it, I would refer to it as six foot chain link fence with three strands of barbed wire. Top, topped with three strands. Top with three strands. Oh, oh, plus six foot chain link fence plus three strands of barbed wire. Do you think leaving it generic top with barbed wire is sufficient in case they put four? I think, I think top, so. Top with three. Well, the, the plans show it. You're approving the site plan, so the site plans okay. have it on there. As long as you don't take the liberty to change a razor wire or something like that, we would very much object to that. No, we don't use razor wires. Any other questions or comments on that? No. Access issues big though. All right, access issue. Uh, and as I read is, uh, is the version we're talking about because we're incorporating significant comments from council. Access issue. Access to the cell tower will be provided through an existing gravel lane located on an abutting farm property. The farm property is not located in either the town center district, that should be capitalized, or the wireless communication overlay district. Hubbardston Zoning Bylaw, Article 5, Development Regulations, Section 5.3, On-Site Parking Requirements, Subsection E.2, prohibits access drives from crossing zones in which the use to be served is not allowed in the district in which the access is located. Section 5.3 also provides that access to a lot must be through its front, uh, frontage. The cell tower site cannot be accessed through the lot's main street frontage due to extensive wetlands, as stated above. To address the two issues, Vertex applied to the Hubbardston Zoning Board of Appeals ZBA for variances from the two provisions. The variances were not granted by the ZBA, although the applicant asserts that the variances were constructively granted through the operation of MGL Chapter 40A, Section 5, Paragraph 5. Um, she has a comment on there that. Is, yes, uh, I was going to pause for that comment. There is a, a question that comes up. Is the planning board satisfied that Vertex has demonstrated the presence of wetlands is extensive enough to prohibit access? via the frontage. That was a question that, that was from Bill's statement. He thought it was too wide to be across the wetland. Well, they haven't. Uh, what level of detail do you want for proof? I didn't hear that. I'm what sorry. level of detail do you want for proof? Um, the GIS maps show a pretty significant wetland. So the property drops down and then drops up on the hill. And at the bottom of the hill, closer to Main Street, there's a pretty significant wetland. Um, so I shouldn't be making the argument on the applicant's part to say yes. whether it's significant or not and whether they can or they can't, but under the Wetlands Protection, so I'm doing it. Under the Wetlands Protection Act, you're allowed to alter 5,000 square feet of wetlands without a variance from the Wetlands Protection Act. And once you go over 5,000 square feet, you're going into extremely muddy waters uh, it is allowed. It's called a limited project. Um, and if there is no alternative to gain access to your backland, you can fill wetlands to gain access to your backland. Generally, it's assumed for a housing development project, but the reasonable use of the land. I'm not going there. Um, it would be expensive, difficult, and costly to do. Uh, impossible, definitely not impossible, but I think it's characterized in, in this application earlier on as, um, uh, how do we phrase it? not reasonably developable. So if you take cost out, it could possibly be done. 
So what are the board's thoughts on um, if we are at or near the sufficiency of evidence? Can I comment quickly? Yes. Um, there's multiple concerns. One is the steepness of the slope. Two is the existing wetlands as shown on the town GIS map and on our um, uh, site plans. There's also a watershed protection district that we're not allowed to drive through. Um, so we were trying to avoid that as well. Um, and given the drainage concerns expressed by the abutters um, to the main street side of the property, um, I think there's ample evidence to show that there that is not a viable alternative. Uh, uh, without, uh, you know, it, 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 when you just look at the grade alone, it's, it's substantial. And, and and I, if I might add one thought to that, this is Tom Johnson again. I'm, on Zoom, um, there's also a, a potential vernal pool on the GIS layers, and as friend mentioned, a zone A surface water protection area that um, runs along the entire, uh, cuts across each one of those lots. So um, in addition to crossing a wetland, you'd have to cross through that zone A, and that has some additional constraints. Can we amend it to say the cell tower site cannot be reasonably accessed, accessed through the lot's main street frontage due to extensive wetlands, slope and vernal pools, or what do you guys want to say? I'd like you to use the shape of the land, the topography and um, soils in addition to wetlands and other environmental constraints. And I use those words very carefully. Okay, it cannot be reasonably reasonably developed that was the uh, is it re reasonably accessed through the lot's main street frontage due to extensive wetlands topography what are your words so due to the combination of the shape of the lot soils topography and perennial steep slopes and other environmental constraints. And now I'm going to explain why I'm using <coughs> those phrases. So the granting of a variance is must be related to shape of the lot, soils, or topography under Mass General Law. Those are the basic criteria for the granting of a variance. Um, and I, it's my honest belief that all of those conditions exist there. Okay, so this now this sentence has been modified to read, the cell tower site cannot be reasonably accessed through the lot's main street frontage due to a combination of shape of the lot, soils, topography, parens, steep slopes, and other environmental constraints, period. Yep. Okay, got that everybody? Okay. So. I don't know whether you read the next sentence or where you left off, but. Hmm. Nope, the, I, uh, I believe I made it to the end of the paragraph. Uh, additional uh, comments, questions on that section from the board, council, Mr. Murray. And, and, yeah. and you used the word lane a couple times, at least one time again, but we need to change. First, sentence, first line. Actually, the cell tower provided through an existing driveway. Driveway. Right. Uh, just for future note, if uh, anybody else leaves, please shut the door behind you all the way so <laughs> it doesn't leave. It's, it's going to go off. Is it? Yeah. It's about 24. Uh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. I, I've counted. <laughs> that, or, sir? When I came in, the middle, there's a, a countdown on the little box. Yeah. You have an official role. Yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of these days, the town will trust me enough to give me the security code, or else we'll have an admin at the meetings with us again. Count the one of those things will happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope. Um, I, I'm reasonably, uh, I'm, right now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the DEP wetlands on the GIS map and I just for the purposes of the board, this, that, this is the property in question, left to right, do have uh, the indication that these are, are the wetlands. Show up. Uh, just want to make sure. That, and again, this is, this is GIS map. Right, right, right. Okay? This is not a 
source other than the one you probably also use sometimes just to do a cursory review. Okay. All right. Again, I'm still saying that, that they're through heroic efforts they could potentially cross those wetlands. Just so well, I'm not stating anything against that. I'm just simply stating that there is a very, very clear yes. demonstration yes. on the GIS that there are wetlands on this particular like, piece of property. And it's a, a higher level of wetlands because it's what's known as a zone A, which Correct. is a tributary to a surface water supply which has even more environmental regulations attached to it. Anything else on that paragraph? No. Right. On to the next one. Uh, the applicant filed an application for variances with the Town of Hubbardston Zoning Board of Appeals, parenthesis, the Zoning Board, close parentheses, uh, parentheses, the application, close parentheses. The application was stamped and received by the town clerk for the town of Hubbardston on May 10, 2022. Said application sought variance relief from Hubbardston Zoning Bylaw Article 5, Section 5.3E.2 access drives to permit access to a proposed wireless communication facility parentheses cell tower close parentheses to be located at 14 main street hubbardston uh, tax map and parcel number 08-a-041 via properties located at 7 brigham street hubbardston tax map and parcel number 08-a051 and 9 brigham street Hubbardston tax map and parcel number 08-A-049 on August, uh, that was the end of that sentence, on August 29th, the town clerk signed and stamped a notice of constructive grant. Uh, the grant or denial of a, variance you, uh, of a variance to use the parcels off Brigham Street is not within purview of the planning board, however, Zoning bylaw section 7.1a, uh, 9.4i, and 18.5.2.e do require the planning board to consider access. And any questions about that paragraph? Are you adding that statement at the end? From yes. council? Uh, Citing the various sections or just that information? That, yes, it, it would be added as written to the record. Yes. And then there's still another paragraph that goes along with that. So. Uh, but we'll get to that if there's no comment on that. All right, moving on to the next paragraph. There, uh, Vertex plans to use an existing gravel driveway. An existing driveway. Lo located on abutting privately owned land for access to construct the cell tower and maintain equipment, the existing lane will be shared with the farmer who owns the land through a private easement agreement. Driveway. The existing driveway. The public is prohibited from both the privately owned farmland and tower site. The cell tower is essentially a utility and private easement agreements are commonly used to reach utility installations. The gravel lane is not an access road to a parking lot or other publicly available space. A cell tower is an unmanned structure with no public access that does not require a parking lot and does not generate traffic from customers, employees, deliveries or from the service it provides parenthesis other than occasional maintenance vehicles and parentheses uh, board council mr murray uh, i might request that you strike the sentence the cell tower is essentially a utility i know it's for my benefit but it, uh, we're not a utility we're not regulated by the puc and uh, uh the first cell tower I ever built was uh, uh, taken down because the building inspector called it a utility and uh, it wasn't. Uh, thoughts from the board council, Mr. Murray, on that? You can strike the sentence if you want. 
Are you getting rid of and private easements? Yeah, Three. exactly. The whole sentence. It, well, it has to because afterwards, the, the, the reason it is actually being presented is, is because of the fact that they're looking at it as the easement agreements are typically reached between a utility. Yeah, I think the purpose of this session is to sort of articulate how the access is going to be, um, you know, how, how the access is going to exist. That is stated very clearly yeah. in the in the yeah. paragraph. Yeah. But the, the here, the, the only thing it, it actually does is provides a rationale for right. why the That's easement is. Yeah. But it is faulty in the sense, as Mr. Uh, Parisi indicates, in that the cell tower is not a utility. So that is not the proper example to utilize. If you have a different example that can yeah. be prepared and presented, then we would love to entertain that. Agreed. Yeah. No. I mean, we want to be accurate. Yeah. 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 Um, if I can just come on public space I mean it's certainly a non-public space um, the, the point was that the article and again it's not our jurisdiction it's the ZBA but the article 5 is development standards for access it's under um, it's under parking requirements All right so the point is that it's not a driveway to a parking sure lot. no yeah right Right. So I you can take out the utility language and it still states the... Uh, you know what, I didn't realize you were saying that, but it, 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 I think that's a good observation. Well, should we say, that, is that something that should be said more expressly? Is that what the alternative language is, or is it just good for the... I, I think it's message? clear from what's there, even without it. But yeah. Okay. So we're striking this particular sentence out. Because the follow-on right. sentence says the gravel driveway is not an access road to a parking lot or other publicly available space, right. so you've got it covered. Okay. Thank you, Council Mr. Murray. Any other, anything else on that? All right. I think you could take the public space as redundant. So if he says not like, uh, uh, yeah. is an access road to a, is, is <coughs> not an access road to a public, parking lot or other publicly available space, then it says a cell tower is an unmanned structure, you can strike the no public access because you've said it, right, is an unmanned structure that does not require a parking lot and does not generate traffic. Okay. So uh, we're striking that? Just that one three-word three phrase. With no public access is struck. Any other discussion? that paragraph or the concepts there within or that issue in general because that would be the end of that issue as far as I can say. All right, Article 7, Special Permits. Uh, Article 7, Section 7.1, the Planning Board must find that the proposed use satisfies the following criteria before granting a special permit. A. Shall not have vehicular or pedestrian traffic of a type and quantity so as to cause significant adverse effect to the neighborhood. B. Shall not have a number of residents. Oh, uh, excuse me. Before we get into this article, um, we I have a note that we were going to hold to talk about radiation at some point. Is now the appropriate time? Is that an issue, or do we come back to that for <coughs> environmental factors where it comes from? I would like to consider this here under the environmental okay. community impact analysis, section Article 8. Okay. So back to Article 7, uh, which is the criteria that the planning board has to follow for determining special permits under our bylaws. Uh, C, shall not have a greater lot coverage than allowed in the zoning district in which the premises are all are located, shall not be dangerous to the immediate neighborhood or the premise through fire, explosion, emission of waste, or other causes, shall not create such noise, vibration, dust, heat, smoke, fumes, odor, glare, adverse visual effects, or other nuisance or serious hazard as so to adversely affect the immediate neighborhood, shall not cause degradation of the environment. Uh, that is taken directly. So we can bring that up under that. Uh, well, it's going to come up. It's going right. to come up and under under. Right. Article yeah, that, that's just a statement of what our bylaw is. Right. That's what we. Proof. That's so our burden of proof here. This. His burden of proof. Our, yeah. We need to find right. Our standard of review. His burden of proof. Uh, so. Uh, so then the, 
uh, they correspond to those criteria. Yes. The planning board finds uh, that the above criteria are met for the following reasons. A. The cell tower installation will generate no pedestrian traffic and only vehicular traffic and the only vehicular traffic will be from occasional service vehicles entering to maintain the telecommunications equipment installed on the cell tower. I think B. we should add to that phrase once the it's a following construction or something, once the tel cell tower is constructed. Right? Correct. And I think, I don't know how you want to handle this. But maybe we want to do um, like sub votes on each of the articles or something. Um, I would just simply say, and so the cell tower installation will generate no pedestrian traffic, and post construction phase, the only vehicular traffic will be from occasional service vehicles entering the main uh, to maintain the telecommunications equipment installed on the cell tower. If anyone, I guess probably the best way to handle that is if anyone on the board uh, has a strong objection or a um, uh, or feels we need to discuss something here with more depth, uh, just say hold and we'll come back to it. Okay. And let's do it that way. Sure. Because the minutes would be a mess if we just added each one. That's what everything. Good, good uh, point. The, the cell tower, it's already going to be great minutes for three and a half hours. Yeah. Maybe four. Uh, the cell tower installation will not have residents, employees, customers, or visitors other than the occasional service personnel to maintain the telecommunication communications equipment installed on the cell tower. C. The cell tower installation will be entirely located in the town center district and wireless communications overlay district. D. The cell tower shall not be dangerous to the immediate neighborhood or the premises through fire, explosion, emission of waste, or other causes because there are no residential structures in the immediate vicinity of the cell tower installation and all neighbor, neighboring structures are located far from the fall zone, uh, parentheses, approximately 1,000 feet, close parentheses. The cell tower installation will be grounded from lightning strikes and electrical connections to the grid will be underground. The cell tower installation includes equipment to respond to emergencies. Local police and fire will be provided with emergency access. The cell tower installation will be surrounded by barbed wire topped with fencing with a locked gate. All equipment located on the ground will be in secured storage containers. The cell tower installation will have no sanitary facilities and will emit no waste. Uh, Stormwater runoff, uh, and this I think but stormwater runoff has been addressed in the drainage calculation study and site plan. So, um, I got a, the fall zone. I've forgotten what the fall zone is. It's a multiple of the height of the tower, right? It is 100 and, uh, 150, but you add something to it. The fall zone. Is it 110%? Or yeah, it's 110 percent of the, of the tower's uh, height. In this particular case, again, correct me if I'm wrong, the tower is 140 feet plus, oh, plus your lightning rod. The, just, you know, the tower is 149 on top of a one foot foundation, so we've said 150 feet. And you have the lightning rod on top exactly. of that, which and is 10 feet, I believe it is, or 5 feet, whatever so that 15, is. Um, uh, 15 times 10, you know, 165 feet. Okay, so 100. 100 but that's, well, that, that's the radius. That, that would be the radius. If you would do a circle around this here, the radius would have to be, it's less than 200 feet, it's about 165 feet, plus uh, the 10%, the so that's another 16 and a half feet. So roughly about 175 to 180 feet. Yes, yes. On each, that's the radius? Uh, radius, correct. Because it could fall so in I, any my direction. parentheses is wrong is the problem here. It's located far from the fall zone. Well, I guess it's okay. Yes, the properties are. Yeah. 364. So I guess the question there is whether that's confusing. Because it is confusing because the properties, it's or, the properties are. are the falls. I think you could just take it out, maybe, but. Yes. Yeah. Striking. Because it's defined in the bylaw. Okay. Yeah. 
take it out. Okay. I am always in favor of simplification. Is all those other things true, actually? Do you provide, it does, does it, it is there emergency access equipment if lightning strikes the tower or if some um, other catastrophe happens? It's monitoring. No, the, 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 the telecommunic, no, the equipment in the equipment cabinets are monitored um, for like heat and smoke and things like that. Uh, so if there's any, and so the, if there's any excessive heat, they are monitored. And uh, uh, but it's not it's not connected to public safety. It, it's, it's monitored by a, a network operating system. Okay. So you have remote sensors on these. Uh, re what I mean by remote sensors is is that you have a sensor at the location that is remotely monitored. That's correct. Yes. Okay. So is it accurate or inaccurate to say? I know it has a lightning strike, right? We'll collect. Uh, and the connections are going to be underground. Go through these. Each one. Are they all true? And if they're not, how do they need to be changed? Uh, yep. I had circled underground and confirmed that it was. Uh, the cell tower installation includes um, monitoring equipment to respond uh, to emergencies. That's correct. Yes, yeah. I like that. Monitoring. You want to put in the word monitor. Yeah. Local police and fire will be provided with emergency access. You do that. Yep. Correct. Knock yep. Box. Yep. And the cell tower installation will be surrounded. We did that, and you have a locked gate, right? Yep. And all equipment on the ground will be secured in storage containers, locked storage containers. Yep. So put in the word lock. Okay. So then, then that's right, right? So this brings us to E, but go ahead. Uh, well, the, we have the stormwater sentence that oh. was added by Carol. Um, because that's... And I guess we also kind of have a procedural question to get to because if we do survive reviewing this document all the way through and get to the point where we do something on it, that would still be something that's outstanding. Right. Um, but it has been addressed. <laughs> and it's instead of has been, it would be is addressed in the drainage calculation and site plan. So you can make something subject yeah. to a drainage calculation okay. site okay. plan that yes. is actually incorporated in this okay. to the satisfaction of the board. Assuming that we can get to that point. Yep. Right. E, the cell tower installation will not create noise, vibration, dust, heat, smoke, fumes, odor, or glare. Visibility of the tower will be minimal as demonstrated by the balloon test and due to the tower's remote location in a wooded area. The cell tower installation will not adversely affect the immediate uh, board, com uh, board comments, council. I do have a very quick question. Uh, can you again, Mr. Parisi, just confirm that there are no generators or is there a generator? There eventually will be a generator. Uh, can't give you specs because it's so there may be fumes but these would be fumes that are emanated just from the generator other than that there's nothing else um, yeah I don't know that generators emit fumes they do uh, they do uh, as, as part of their their, um, their the, the um, fumes that come out of the muffler or the system out there but other than that there's nothing else than yeah, that right? uh, yeah uh, exactly there's no fumes there's no smoke other than generator but, uh, but there's a fuel source there still be a fuel source. There is a fuel source, which is a quantity greater than household use potentially. It depends on whether it's diesel or whether it's propane or some other. Do we know what that quantity would be? Um, no, and the reason is is because we don't install the generators the tenants do, and they all have different specs for a generator. Um, I would just say any on-site generators shall be compliant with all applicable regulations. Because okay. if, if there's a regulation that the town has, then any uh, one would be required to comply with that. No, we want it to meet NFPA standards, National Fire Protection Association standards. That's pretty standard. standard. yeah, That sounds pretty reasonable. reasonable. Yeah, exactly, yes. Okay. And the reason we do that is you, you go to the broadest, you and I know this, we, you go to the broadest standard, when they change the standard, Correct. the town doesn't have to chase its own tail to make sure the most current is updated. Okay, so does that mean we're talking about a F here and F being 
generator <coughs> installation will mean? No, no, I would include that with E. I, I think, unfortunately, you need an F because you have A, B, C, D, E, F and in the criteria, the findings, but you don't have a finding for that. That is correct. I was going to bring that up. Oh. Also, also, we have to change E because E doesn't really work, work the way it's worded. So the test on E is shall not create such noise, vibration, dust, heat, smoke, fumes, odor, glare, adverse visual effects, or other nuisance or serious hazards so as to adversely affect the immediate neighborhood. So that co does correspond to E in the bottom. So E yeah. in the bottom does correspond to E in the top. Yes. I think the only thing that we're adding here is, is that there's, there are, you know, other than the fuel fire generator that does create some I call it fumes because this is it's the out, it's, it's the carbon dioxide plus whatever else comes out of that. But that I think should, uh, the, the generator should be in D, where you list the components, not dangerous to fire, explosion, emission of waste, or other causes. So those those are the two things. Would that be the generator or the fuel tank itself? They're one and the same. Correct. Okay. They're usually. I thought that there you mentioned that there is a substantial fuel tank that is separate. So. The way a diesel generator is arranged is it's got a, what's known as a belly tank. The generator sits on top of the diesel fuel tank. If it's a propane tank, it's like a propane tank that sits. But are they an integrated uh, unit or are they separate units? The diesel is an always an integrated unit. Uh, propane is a, a separate propane tank next to a generator. Okay. I mean, I'm fine with putting it under D. So, I mean, as long as it's captured somewhere. I'm, I'm so I'm let's put it, if we go generator it, and fuel supply. Okay. So, so if we put um, the lightning strike clause, right? From lightning strikes and electrical uh, connection, the grid will be underground. So, what do you want to say about the generators and tanks? What do you, that that are make it safe to put it there? The generator and fuel supply installation shall comply with N A S B N F T A. NFPA. Applicable NFPA standards for emergency generator installations. Yeah, what was the and was that it wraps in all the electric codes and all the structure codes. And MG, it's what was National the Fire, NFPA, Na National, National Fire, Fire Protection, Protection Act Association. Or, Association. Yeah. They're actually out of Quincy, Mass. MPAC. Nope. NFPA. Okay. Noah, Frank, Paul, Alex. Okay, so generator and fuel supply shall comply with all applicable, applicable NFPA standards? Standards. What? Okay, so that's the clause we need to add. And then the South Tower will include monitoring equipment to respond to emergencies, then local police. So I guess it is for people on the board comfortable with concluding that it's not an immediate danger to the neighborhood due to those reasons. Yeah, as far as the, the fire protection, um, because uh, ultimately NFPA is a, a better authority on that than we are. Um, so I, I think that makes sense to base it in, in something like that. So uh, D here, I think this is now an appropriate time to, uh, to actually bring up a radiation conversation. I thought we were doing that for the environment. Yeah, but I don't think, because D is specifically shall not be dangerous to immediate neighborhood uh, or the premises through fire, explosion, emission of waste, or other causes, I think we're, we're squarely on the nose there for the conversation. Okay. Okay, fine. On, on the... Um, Actually, I did some research because the comments worried me about, are these dangerous? Are they not? What's the deal? So I did, I did look up the FCC's, this is for the, for the public, right? So it's not too far into the weeds. Uh, but they say, um, they do sort of explain the story here. And it's, it is true that you can have emissions at a dangerous level, particularly 
for, but it, it's related to how many megahertz the system is generating and how close the source of the megahertz generation is to the person that lives there. So without reading, because it's already the third hour, but this does say, um, I don't know where to pick this up from, these antennas, meaning cell phone, are the antennas that are mounted to your tower. These antennas are rectangular panels, about one to four feet in size, typically mounted on a rooftop or other structure, which were other structure, but they are also mounted on, to on powers, towers or poles, and of course ours is a tower. Panel antennas are usually arranged in three groups of each. It is common that not all antennas are used for the transmission of RF energy. Some antennas may be receive only, if that makes sense. And then it says, at a given cell site, the total RF power that could be radiated by antennas depends on the number of radio channels transmitters install, the power of each transmitter, the type of antenna. So while, while it says it is theoretically possible for cell sites to radiate at very high power levels, the maximum power radiated in any direction usually does not exceed 500 watts. The RF emissions from cellular or PCS base station antennas are generally directed towards the horizon in a relatively narrow pattern in a vertical plane. In the case of sector panel antennas, is that what you're proposing, sector panel antennas, the pattern is fan-shaped like a wedge cut from a pie. As with all forms of electromagnetic energy, the power density from the antenna decreases rapidly as one moves away from the antenna. Consequently, ground level exposures are much less than exposures as if one were at the same height directly in front of the antenna. Measurements made near typical cellular and PCS installations, especially those with tower mounted antennas, have shown the ground level power densities are hundreds to thousands of times less than the FCC's limit for safe exposure. This makes it extremely unlikely that a member of the general public could be exposed to RF levels in excess of FCC guidelines due solely to cellular or PCS base station antennas located on towers or monopoles. So, I guess I'm, I'm looking for, is, is this a good description of what you're doing? Yes, thank you very much. And because this is put out by the FCC as information to the public on how dangerous cell towers are. And I'll put it in the record if you want. But that's my view and I, and I so I don't, want to, I don't want to discount the lady who's concerned about it. It's a legitimate concern. But it seems to me, it is a question, this is 150 feet up in the air and 700 to 1,000 feet from her home. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna radiate cancer through Hubbardston. I just don't believe. Yeah, I think that summed it very well. The FCC regulates exposure limits. And exposure is a function of the power and the distance from the power source. And we submitted a report that shows that even if there were four sets of antennas on this, all broadcasting at their maximum power output, which is really if, if there was like a, a, a big festival in, in Hubbardston where there was thousands of people and all the radios were broadcasting at the same time and they were being utilized, that would be the, the maximum. And we can calculate that based on the, the capacity of the antennas. And just based on the, uh, um, the, the height of the tower, the height of the antennas, so, which is one of the benefits of building a taller structure is to uh, get them away from the ground, away from the property lines. And you know the report that we showed showed that um, the maximum um, levels that would be achieved uh, for exposure limits would be about under 1% of the applicable FCC limits. And that's a function of the fact that we're so far away from property lines, so far away from residences, so far and so high in the air. And, and the, the power limits um, limitations of, of these type of antennas. Uh, 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 and, and, you know, people need to be, uh, Tom needs to be concerned because he works, Tom the engineer, because he works on cell phone installations and he might be two or three feet away and he knows when he goes that close, he's got to wear a monitor. But, you know, you don't wear it when you're 
12 and 15 feet away or when you're on the ground at the base of the cell tower because the energy just dissipates so rapidly. Uh, so, uh, um, and, and it, it um, um, you know, it's really evident by the fact that um, your bylaw actually encourages use of existing structures. If we could have gone on the church steeple, if we could have gone on the, the school building uh, and the town would have allowed it, we would have done that. And, uh, um, and like I said, we've done these installations on residential buildings and in major metropolitan areas and in other churches and things like that where um, that's really the only alternative. And, uh, um, um, you, know, um, you know, people have gotten over the concern. I'll also point out that there's an existing tower right now at the fire station a block from here. Yeah. And it's only about 40 feet tall. And it's the same type of energy emission. It's just a different frequency range. And it's actually more powerful because it's at a lower frequency designed to travel at a higher distance. And the town of Hubbardson is living with that for, for years and years and years. And it's proposing something bigger and taller down the street, across the street from a public park. And uh, you know, it's the same issue. We've been living with um, radio and public safety and Wi-Fi. We're in a, a room with Wi-Fi right now. And the, the FCC regulates our exposure to that. So we, we live with RF emissions every day, everywhere we go. And uh, um, you know, it's, it's just something that we, we learn to live with. The FCC has done an immense amount of research. Science has proven it's safe. And, uh, I so in 2002, when our bylaw was passed, we have a regulation, at the, I think, that requires a letter from the Department of Health something yeah, and you uh, wrote in your yeah, we, opinion they no longer issue it is that correct yeah we used to have to submit that exposure report to the Department of Public Health and they would sign off on it and because they were getting thousands of letters that all said the same thing they stopped responding to it they no longer require it so it's a it's a it's a regulation that's no longer in effect and uh, and what they basically said is we defer to the FCC as long as you're meeting the Apple FCC limits for uh, exposure limitations, then the, 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 the state government is satisfied. I don't know if this is something that you or your engineer feel comfortable doing because I think the word radiation gets thrown out a lot for a lot of different things because, for example, I am currently beaming infrared radiation at you from my face right now. Right. Uh, and there's differences between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. And ionizing radiation is the kind that we talk about stripping, um, stripping atoms off of DNA and doing right. those kinds of things. Uh, is it possible for you or your engineer to talk about that uh, for a moment? Um, Tom is really a civil engineer, not a radio frequency engineer, so probably not. He could talk about it as simply as I can. Um, um, but like I said, we submitted the report from the radio frequency engineer showing that it, it, um, it is well under Apple FCC exposure limits. I think that should suffice. But to, to the best of your knowledge, you are talking about um, microwave frequencies that would qualify as non-ionizing radiation. Non-microwave frequencies like that would qualify as non-ionizing. That's correct. Okay. Um, Additional discussion from the board, proposed edits, revisions there. That's just my opinion, but I do think, but it did come from the FCC site. So if you want to put this in, we'll uh, We'll certainly enter it into, uh, into the record for the board. Uh, any, uh, well, we do need to talk about an F but any, uh, any objections from anybody on the board about proceeding forward to an F? All right, so moving forward to F. Oh, I think, uh, no, I think e, e needs to be re re reviewed again from my perspective, if you don't mind. And the reason I'm yep. saying that is, is because, and I, and I think we just need to indicate that the cell tower installation will not adversely affect uh, the immediate neighborhood, but it also, we said here, so the, um, let me see here, one second. E shall not create such noise, dust, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera affect the immediate neighborhood. And it's indicated here, is it the, uh, 
visibility of the cell tower will be minimal as demonstrated by the balloon test and due to the tower's remote location in the wooded area. I think, and this is, this is my, my, my take on this here, there have been individuals who have indicated that there is an, that there is a, uh, a viewability concern. I think we just need to state the concern, but it is limited to a to, to, to those people who are living uh, probably in the closest proximity. Uh, and, it's, and it has only been voiced by a, 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 a group of people whose, whose proximity towards this. Uh, we, we, I, I think we need to attest, we need to, uh, we need to acknowledge that. So is, is, that addre is that addressed by, if we were to say reasonably <coughs> minimal? As opposed to that is actually a standard set forth so it, it was the standard set forth as minimal or reasonably minimal it's the the standard set forth in the bylaws shall not create such noise vibration dust heat smoke and fumes odor glare adverse visual effects or other nuisance or serious hazard so as to adversely affect the immediate neighbor so that's the question. Well, so that's maybe the crisp of the, the, crux of the <coughs> question, I think. What would be the edit that would address your concern here, Francois? I guess the question here is, is I mean, it's, I don't consider that a, a hazard. I consider it a potential, a potential nuisance. And it's just, and, and that it has been voiced and expressed by a, subs, by a subset of the population. And it is, and was, co and was considered by the board. In, 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 you know, we're considering it as, as part of all of the, the factors here. So after we should put visual effects. And it's just a visual right. effect. Visual effects were were expressed concern over visual effects. Yes, right? concerns of the visual effect were 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 expressed by by by. Members of the public. Members of the public, yes. And taken into consideration. And are taken into and are taken into consideration. Okay, and then do you want to believe I, I mean, I do think visibility of the cell tower will be minimal as demonstrated by the balloon test <coughs> is true. That is absolutely true. And due to towers, maybe you don't want to, maybe that's too remote is too strong a word. The tower's location, I don't know, how. what is the nearest I home? think the, the uh, wording as it is itself, the visibility of the cell tower will be minimal as demonstrated by the balloon test and due to the tower's remote location, the wooded area can stay as is. We can indicate subsequently that there was a subset of individuals or uh, members of the public uh, who, who did express that it is, uh, uh, you, you worded it there. Uh, well, I was going to ask if council had a recommendation. Here. I liked what you said. Um, um, visibility was taken into account. Because we have that, we have that as a record, and we just need to okay, acknowledge sure. the fact that it is something that was saying, in, right? was incorporated as part of our decision making before that sentence, right? Right. Okay, so uh, so it read concern. What I had said was concern over visual effects. Concerns over visual effects were expressed by members of the public and taken into consideration by the board. Correct. I think that that is appropriate. I mean, I don't want to. Yeah. Just it is. It, it it was something that was obvious. We should not skirt that. <coughs> any, any other questions or comments from the rest of the board? No. Thank you. You could say the board. The board concludes that the cell tower installation will not adversely affect the immediate neighborhood. If you want, I don't know. I mean, it's. There's some subjectivity in this. It's our finding, right? Yeah, that was why I suggested the word reasonable. Um, and I don't know if that makes sense with the standard because everything affects 
everybody in some way or form. If I put a light on the back of my house, that affects my neighbors. But is the placement of the light on the back of my house uh, reasonable? Is it an unreasonable intrusion into my neighbor's life? Well, and, and then there's also the consideration of the cost and benefit, I mean, when, or the negative impact okay. versus the positive impact. And I think that's really ultimately what the board has to decide. Yeah. Something that is a, some, in my opinion, something that is dangerous, something that is uh, potentially uh, adversely affecting uh, potential the health of somebody is, is very different than being something that uh, is, is visually maybe not appealing. How about based upon the balance of the evidence, visibility of the cell tower will be a minimal as demonstrated by the I'm okay with that. If the, if the, if the board is okay with that. Yeah, sounds great. Right. So you're putting that as a, before the first, the last sentence? Yes. F. I don't know, I dropped this and I forgot about F. Yeah, we need an F. Um, Shall not cause degradation of the environment. And I just want to do a bit of a status and help check on the board here because we are at. I, I, I'd like to get this done with personally. I, I would, if, if the rest of the board is okay with it. I would also like to go through it, but I don't want to impose it. Nope. I'll way. stick it out because stick I think out. that we are at the end of the yeah. our time to act here. Yeah, okay. uh, so uh, with that said, uh, how about a five minute recess for a bio break? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Form a line. Yes. Uh, so yes, let's have a five minute recess for the bio so break. We will reconvene at uh, 9.30. Nine thirty one, nine thirty two? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
persuading the council to fall back in order. Oh. Ritual assessment. back to order the meeting of the Hubbardston Planning <coughs> Board, uh, reminding everybody that this meeting is recorded and broadcast live, uh, recognizing that we have a quorum of the board present in the room, and that we also have a quorum of the board for the purpose of uh, voting on a special permit present. Uh, we had left off going down the, um, what would be a potential uh, special permit for the purpose of guiding our discussion and resolving issues, and we've made pretty good progress um, resolving issues. Uh, I'm sure we still have some to go, but we're, we're doing it. So we left off at item F uh, because uh, there is a uh, there is a criteria that says shall not cause degradation of the environment, uh, which is a standard of review for us. So we to say that standard of review is met for a reason. So do we have any suggestions from the board on what that item F should look like? Or I got a, a, I'll send the something up as a trial balloon, which is uh, the cell tower will involve clearing of a 75 foot by 75 foot area for the tower installation and improving an existing driveway. For this reason and others stated above, the planning board concludes that the tower shall not cause degradation to the environment. I guess the point I'm trying to make is if you do the math, it's about a seventh of an acre among this 83 acres that the farmer owns and the other six at the top. Well, yeah, the lot itself is 13 acres. Yeah. And then, yeah, so. But the top, well, the top, right. So it's. So maybe you want to say, well, including a, seven, a 75 by 75 foot area. Um, Would you say limited to a 75 foot by 75 it, foot uh, area? Will be limited to, right. Limited to clearing. I, the clearing is a little bit bigger than that. The, the lease area, the fence is 60 by 60. We lease 75 by 75. And the limited clearing is shown on the plans. But it's it's not material. Approximate. Yeah, 75 yeah. by 75. Yeah, I know from the site visit, the clearing already is bigger than. 60 by 70 or so. You, I can go bigger. I mean, it's still, it's a. I did that calculation because I was trying to get a handle on how big the spot was you're clearing in comparison with the forest and the fields around it, right? And it's about a seventh of an acre if it's 75 by 75. Is, is that going to be the size of the installation itself? Um, so the tower cell, so the tower will. I, I would just say the limit of clearing as shown on the site plans. Because that, it, that's clearly delineated. Yeah. Okay. Shown on the <coughs> site plan for the tower installation and improving an existing driveway. Okay. For this reason and other reasons stated above, the planning board concludes that the tower shall not cause degradation of the environment. I mean, there are other reasons, no separate <coughs> systems, and all the things we just stated in D above, right? I mean, yep. these are somewhat redundant. Does that work for people? Yep. Okay. Okay, so just to read it into, uh, into the record here, the cell tower will be limited to a clearing as shown on the site plan and improving an existing driveway. For this reason and the others stated above, that is a hanging sentence. Um, for this reason and the others stated above, uh, 
the planning board concludes yeah. that the tower shall not cause vegetation of the environment. Article 8, Environment and Community Impact Analysis. Article 8.3 of the Hubbardston Zoning Bylaws provides that, uh, provides that four concerns must be addressed in each of six categories. The four concerns are, A, the environmental and community impacts of the proposed use and or development. B, the adverse impacts which cannot be avoided should, be, should the proposed use and or development be implemented. C, alternatives to the proposed use and or development. D, measures to be used to minimize adverse environmental and community impacts. That's an extract. I don't think there's a lot to debate there, but is there anything? No. Uh, the six categories are natural environment, including air and noise pollution, water pollution, land compatibility, parentheses, soils, erosion, sedimentation, close parentheses, plant and wildlife, water supply, sewage disposal. B, man-made environment, including existing neighborhood zoning architecture. C, public service, including schools, police, recreation, solid waste disposal, traffic, and highway. D, aesthetics, including lighting, landscaping, visuals, parentheses, views, close parentheses. E, planning, compatibility, and alternatives with goals and objectives of growth management and open space plan. F, cost-benefit analysis. Anything on that? Uh, applicants addressed the above concerns and criteria individually in the environment and community impact analysis that they submitted. The planning board finds that the proposed cell tower installation will have minimal environmental and community impacts in categories A through D above because it will not be located in a neighborhood. It will not generate pollution or sewerage or use water. View of the tower will be hidden to tree height by the dense forest surrounding the site. View of the top of the tower will be minimal due to its distance from homes and roads as demonstrated by the balloon study photographs. Tree cutting will be limited to area immediately surrounding the fenced installation. Access to tower will be via an existing gravel road. Gravelway. The tower will not be lit at night. Electrical lines will be underground. The project will be unmanned. The tower will comply with zoning. The planning board finds that the cell tower in that should be is, is compatible. Yeah. Is compatible with growth management and open space objectives category E because it will assist businesses without adding the need for residential services. The proposed cell tower will serve. serve for major cell phone providers, thus eliminating the need for other cell towers. The planning board also finds the benefit of the tower outweighs the cost of the project. Vertex will pay for the tower and its installation on privately owned land and post a decommissioning bond, which it shall maintain throughout the active life of the tower. Cell phone providers will provide and service their equipment on the tower. There should be no cost to the town. The installation should generate tax revenue for the town. The tower will benefit almost all cell phone users in the town by providing better cell reception. Comments on any of that so far? Uh, yes. Uh, in the prior page, page 9, where it says planning board finds that the post cell tower installation will have minimal environmental impact, uh, environmental community impacts in categories A through D. Uh, I think uh, we have s we have A through F, and what we have is concerns A through D. I'm not sure if what are we referencing here? Are we referencing the categories, or are we referencing the concerns? That's a good question. Well, here's the deal: is I don't know. I mean, it, it's you, for each of those A through D, you're supposed to address the six. Correct. Individually underneath, 
And I thought doing this, since he had actually put together, if we accept pretty much his submission, mm -hmm. we could just highlight the main reasons. I have no objection in terms of how this was uh, explained later on. I'm just simply stating here that it is either we're addressing concerns A through B for, cate for the categories under A through F. Oh, we maybe because the word, the word categories it, refers, refers to A through D. And, and I'm sorry, you're, you're, I think you're making reference to categories A. Th where you say categories, I think it's actually concerns A yes. through D. Yes, okay, concerns. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, okay. I mean, if you think we need to branch it out more. No, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. I just want to make sure that we're clearly uh, explaining what it is that we are looking at the impacts here. I agree. And we can say impacts on concerns A through D for the six categories mentioned above. Okay. Okay. Quick comment. I don't Absolutely. know if you want to do it or not, but uh, the planning board also finds the benefits of the tower outweigh the cost of the project. And I'd like you to replace the word cost with environment and environmental and community impacts, which is the heading of the entire section. The cost up after the word cost? No, get no, rid of cost. Not. Outweigh the environmental and community impacts of the project. Strike cost. I think that sounds fair. Come on. Okay. Affirmative statement. All right, so I know we have we have flagged. I, I think the bond comes up in commission uh, conditions of special permit, so we'll we'll go back to that conversation. Yes, it does. Item twelve. We'll come back to that there, but we all know that that's a flag issue. So anything else leading up to that? No. no from my end. The planning board finds the only unavoidable adverse impact is view of the tower, which will be minimal for the reasons stated above. The planning board finds that a cell tower is necessary to improve cell service in Hubbardston, and the proposed cell tower is in the best location available to serve the need. So there are no better alternatives to the proposed use and or development. Measures to be used to minimize adverse environmental and community impacts have been discussed above. Anything from the board, council, Mr. Murray? Or applicant? <coughs> Article I I, I'm sorry, I just, I just I thought I saw a typo. Reasons stated above in the second paragraph. Stated above. Yeah. This, this document, uh, by the way, Josh, is fraught with spelling errors. Uh, yeah. And uh, well, we, we, we already have one draft that has them corrected. When, is it Caroline? Yes. Yeah. When Caroline uh, submitted her draft version, it did not incorporate those changes that we already have made. Oh, okay. But we will definitely gotcha. take a look at this here again. Gotcha. There's, there, yeah. there's tons of them. Yeah. We need I just to happen to see that one. Yep. Okay. All right, moving on to Article 9, Site Plan Approval. Vertex filed a detailed multi-page site plan which was reviewed by places and determined by them after revision to be in substantial conformance with the requirements of Article 9 and with Article 18 Wireless Communications Facility. Copies of the site plan were provided to other agencies in town as requested by, required by Section 9.5, and the site plan was advertised and presented at the public hearing as required by Section 9.6. As required by Section 9.7, the Planning Board approves the site plan based upon determination that the development shown on the site plan as approved or modified will have an acceptable level of community or environmental impact <coughs> and will be consistent with the land use objectives of the town, will comply with the purpose of these zoning bylaws as stated in Section 1.2, and will comply with 
the town's zoning bylaws, rules, and regulations of the town of Hubbardston and applicable laws and regulations of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. An approved site plan is valid for two years. Development must be completed within that time unless an extension is granted. Uh, questions, comments, objections from the board? Um, Did the council? failure to comply get striked? Yes, uh, council recommended striking that. Good, so I too. Anything else? Then? to Article 18, Wireless Communication Facility. The Planning Board finds that Vertex's application for a special permit for the construction of a cell tower, including site plan, conforms with all applicable provisions of Article 18, Wireless Communication Facility of the Hubbardston Zoning Bylaws, excluding Sections 18.4.2. See, uh, that's not right. Uh, 18.4.1.C. Uh, .C. Is there a reason they're in, in this in that order? Okay. Well, they in not, in should probably be reversed because one yeah. coming before the other already circle it. Does it? Does it matter from like, substantive No, standards? it's not. It's just I just want to make sure that this was not as a result of a typo. I think it was the way they were presented at the in no, the order go, above, but that's okay. Oh, two C, one C. Those waivers. So those are the. The balloon test hours, stockade fencing, and the monofold. That's what those are. So, uh, one is the structure type. Yep, the yeah, yep. only sector and whip. The monofold, <coughs> the balloon duration, and the fencing and landscaping, I think. Well, excluding the 1841C. Uh, uh, what we're doing is, is we're excluding the town will accept and prefer and prefer new structures camouflaged <coughs> in the nature as flagpoles or greens or any other design which minimizes the adverse visual impact of the wireless community uh, communication facility. That's that's 18.4.1c. Yep. 18.4.2c is. There, there, there is. <laughs> I'm not, maybe I've got one. Maybe I'm missing it here. Um, no, I think you oh, here it is. If the applicant demonstrates that the compliance with section 1842B is not feasible, then the proposed communication facilities must be of the monopole type and camouflaged to the greatest extent possible using artificial screening. So it's both have to do with screening. Well, one has to do with the monopole type. And that's the problem because we had one provision that says you can have a monopole or you can have a lattice tower that was passed in 2015. But prior to that, the bylaw said unless it's attached to the, a building, it's got to be a monopole. Correct. So, uh, again, I'm just stating okay. 18, 1842 C relates to the monopole. Yep. So, we're, we're basically saying that it, it's not applicable. For, so, we're excluding. Right, we're, we're granting excluding a that. waiver. Yep. Yeah, okay, gotcha. I'm not sure that you need 1841C. Well, would you like to dress up your lattice tower um, to look like a tree? It says we'll accept and prefer. Prefer doesn't, doesn't require. The reason why I needed 42C says must, and so therefore we needed some relief from that. Um, yeah, but we're, we're not even accepting it. We're just simply saying it says we're ignoring it. Right. That does. I don't think you need to. Yeah. Oh, it's a waiver. I mean, I don't care. What does council do have an opinion on yeah, this? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's. Wasn't there three? Is there one? Is the balloon test one in particular? The balloon test is the next one, which is which is 18.5.2D. That the. No, the, the 18.5.2D is, no, is, 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 is the stockade fence. 
maybe the balloons. Okay. I think, think as long as you reference each one that you're granting a waiver from and so or saying that they're... So we, we do not... The, the, the balloon test was granted, the waiver was granted during a prior session. But, right. but you still should pick it up here. So then we can include this in yeah. here. And what we did is, is we amended it. So this would be 18.5.2.A. Okay. Well, uh, and it was amended so that it was only uh, up for the hours from 9 to 2, if I am not stating okay. if I state that correctly, right? Yep. So a, sen a sentence after that that says, the planning board also... Waived the requirement for a continuous 24-hour test and limited it to 5 hours? Yes. For reasons cited by the applicant. They referenced the vote, right? Yeah, I don't think you have to put even the reasons. You can just put the yeah. planning board also waived the, contigu the continuous 24 hour test and limited to five hours. Uh, also, but I got to get the reference in there. The planning board also. waived provisions of by it's getting late to think um, oh okay it, it, okay you could say the planning board also waived continuous 24 hour test and limited it to five hours um, as performed yeah, I just have to get the 18.5.2 Yep. Okay, the planning board also granted limited waiver of eighteen point five two A dot A dot A, right. Mm -hmm. Um so the plan board also grant a limited waiver of 18.5.2A, continuous 24-hour test, and limit it by limiting it to five hours. If you want, you can put specifically from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. From 9 a.m. to 2, right? Two p.m. Okay. 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 All right, can you just read that for the record for me? Else? The planning board also granted a limited waiver of eighteen point five point two point A continuous twenty four hour test. by limiting it to five hours from nine to two, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. So that's a separate sentence. Okay. And then you can leave the, the, the board here by grants those requested waivers. Okay. So now we get to is everybody okay with that? I'm okay with that. Conditions? Sure. No objections? Uh, Council, Mr. Mary. I'm fine. Okay. All right, so moving on to conditions on special permits. And there are definitely some things here we're going to be talking about. So, so sir. conditions of special permit. In addition to all other applicable rules and regulation, a granting of the special permit is conditioned upon the following. Drainage calculations must be reviewed and approved by uh, places associates before any construction can commence. 
The agreed upon cost of this review will be, it's currently blank, applicant shall deposit that amount with the planning board within five business days of the signing of this decision. Places will complete the review no later than 14 days from the issuance of this decision. Um, if places requires amendments or corrections to the drainage calculations, uh, calculations, places will promptly notify the planning board chair who will notify the applicant. Um, I think we do need to modify that because places is ultimately recommending um, uh, recommending approval. The planning board actually approves. Is that correct? Or I, I agree with that. Does that, yeah, that down here. does that make sense, Mr. Murray? Because ultimately, we take your we, we obviously give you recommendation heft, um, but we we take your recommendation and we subsequently approve it based upon it. Yeah. So you're striking the last sentence, is what you're saying? I think. Is that? A, I don't have any. What do you guys have as the last sentence? If places requires amendments. Oh, I see. Okay. Yep. 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 Yeah, I think the last sentence is fine, but it should be the drainage calculations must be reviewed by places. By places. Not and approved. Yes. Oh, I see. And approved by the planning board. Okay, I get it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, before any construction can commence. Uh, then we have uh, we have the blank there for the agreed upon cost. Is that is that something that we can estimate now, or is that something that requires work to estimate estimate? Work to estimate. Okay. I'll get something to the board by the end of business on Friday. Okay. You okay with that, Mr. Percy? Uh Depends on where we end up tonight. Are we voting on this tonight? Are we not voting on this tonight? I think there's a pretty good chance we vote on this tonight, uh, but still a few more pages for us all to survive. Um, I think there's a very good chance we vote. Let's, um, Assuming somebody makes a motion. Let's keep going and see what happens. But okay. we can't leave it blank if you're voting on it. No, we're not. Yeah, we're not. It's, it's, well, it, 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 it will be blank because you will receive an estimate. Or we can not to exceed. Well, not to exceed would be better. Okay, and that's up to you two gentlemen to. Do you have not to exceed number? The agreed, you give us? the agreed upon cost or the review will not exceed. You give, can you give us a number? Pull out the calculator. All right, can we can proceed and then we can yeah. get yeah. back onto this here? Yeah. Thanks. Call it four thousand okay. dollars. Will not exceed. number just for clarification includes attending the previous meeting attending this meeting and doing the drainage calculation review Good. Uh, oh, which this is not on the dime so well I I did I did say that the planning board would pay for your time out of this meeting at the last meeting in order to have everybody at the table okay so uh, please submit that to the planning board and we'll pay for that out of our budget Thank you. I want to talk about two when you're ready. Yep. I'm just looking because this is a, I believe this is a place where council's version varies from. Council's version has two blank, right? Yeah, council's version has two blank. Time frames. That was my just suggestion of what would be reasonable. Yeah. So all all the numbers shift uh, because two is blank on council's version. So really three is two. Oh. Okay. But I want to just all right. Unless but I want to add one at the end, or I was just going to make it two and fill in the blank. But she's renumbered them. Yeah. I don't think she has renumbered. Well, council didn't renumber them. Two is left blank. So if you two, have one you'd like two, to add, two. Two. Yes, have, I do, and I and I think that everybody will agree. 
what I wanted you to say was the access easement over the Alto property at 7 Brigham Street to the cell tower site at the back of 14 Main Street shall be extinguished upon the decommissioning and removal of the cell tower. Because I know it's a use, it's a use easement. And I don't want to create a right of way to a commercial property, which is what that is zoned. You have the easement yet? I do, yes. And I'm going to look at it now. That's a good question if they already exist. Would be. Uh, I, I think that's the case. That's why I'm. I'm not certain. They call it extinguishing an easement, right? When the use no longer is there, yep. it should be there. Yeah. Because and I you can, yeah, you can put that right in the language of the easement. It's for this particular use, and when the use goes away, the easement goes away. Because otherwise, you set it up for perpetuity. I mean, it's an inaccessible. It's really a landlocked parcel, otherwise, right? So it goes back to being natural once. So. I don't think it made it into the document. I think, it, I mean, in your easement agreement, you say for the purpose of the access to the cell tower, right? I'm, I'm pretty confident we do that as a matter of course, because we're not trying to create a permanent easement. Uh, but I'm just trying to see what we gave you guys. It, it, it says the easement granted herein shall continue for as long as grantees agreement to construct the facility on the abutting property remains in effect. So it's tied into the uh, the agreement to maintain the cell tower. I'm sorry, can you read that again? The easement over Alto's property shall continue for so long as um, our agreement to operate the cell tower on the subject property remains in effect. Oh, so it does say operate, not just yeah. construct. Yeah, but what happens if Vertex sells the cell tower to somebody else? Then we would also sell the easement to somebody else. But that isn't what that says. Um, no, but the, the, uh, there's other language that says that the easement is for the benefit of successors and assigns. Okay. okay. If you're, I just want so this I think our having language. this in our having okay. this I don't here. have I don't have a problem saying it because that's clearly our intent and that's what our agreement is anyway. So okay. you can put okay. It in. So I want to put that in as two. That makes sense. Yeah. That's you want the language. Okay. Got it. All right. So three, so the site plan approval. Uh, uh, before we do that, that makes sense to you, Council. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, cell, the site plan approval granted by this decision shall not take effect until a copy of the decision has been recorded at the owner's expense in the proper registry of deeds and duly indexed or noted on the owner's certificate of title, a copy of the recorded decision certified by the registry or notification by the owner of the recording, including recording information shall be furnished to the town clerk and planning board. Mm -hmm. You need to say the special permit and the site plan approval. I, yeah, I'm wondering if the conditions of special permit should be changed and site plan review. Yeah, the whole heading. Agreed. Conditions of special permit and site plan review. So it's all inclusive. Conditions of special permit and site plan. And site plan. Yeah. Or you could simply say this approval or the approval granted by this decision and strike out site plan and special permit and just say the approval granted by this decision. Uh -huh, I like it. Refine that. Any other comments from the board, council? No, I think that work. Okay. A copy of this decision shall be maintained at the, uh, a copy, yes, uh, okay. 
A copy of this decision shall be maintained at the site at all times until a final inspection and approval of the site via a completion certificate is issued by the planning board. Um, I've never gotten a completion certificate from any planning board. Um, we get sign off of the building permit from the building inspector. So, um, and I'm going to tell you this is a common theme. I think there's 12 times that I have to come back to the planning board uh, after tonight uh, for multiple approvals. And we routinely deal with the building inspector after this point. Uh, so, my Point to that is we probably have a building commissioner starting in the near future. We most I, likely do. I, I um, that is doesn't bother me because we're not doing anything soon. We still have uh, our federal due diligence to complete. We still have more engineering to do, uh, and so um, you will have a building inspector in place long before we're ready for him. Uh, so, uh, so what? And, and if this decision were to get approved, there's an appeal period that we all have to wait, and then we have to work out the variance issue, which uh, will take some time. And uh, um, so we're not going to the. And then, um, but once we get a positive decision, we have to do far more engineering due diligence. We have to design a foundation. Uh, we have to um, and get more detail for the building inspection. And so I'm just trying to minimize the involvement of the planning board because we could be coming back here 12 times. Right. So I'm going to go to council on that. Well, the fact that it's in quotes, is it is that called for in the bylaw somewhere? No. So we, no, it's not. I don't believe it is. I mean, it's a decision for you guys. I mean, you certainly could, I think, have that as a condition. The applicant's asking for it to be excluded. But do you have a, what, what do I need to get a cert completion certificate? Is there an application? Is there a public hearing? Is it notice to abutters? You know, uh, there is a process to get a building permit sign off. Uh, and, uh, so this would be the building inspector coming back to us with a final inspection and the approval that the site is complying with the building inspector's requirements. That's right, but are you, do you approve that? What if you say no? I'm sorry? I said, what is your mechanism? What is your criteria for approving or denying? You don't have that authority. You don't, the only authority. No, I'm just reading what it says here. And so no, the no, way no. the way it says is here, and my interpretation here is, is the final inspection would actually not be done by us, but it would be done by the building inspector, based on the criteria set forth here, and the approval of the site. So they would come back right. to us and say this has been met, and as a result of that, we can issue a completion certificate. But what is this? Uh, can, I, can I add a couple of thoughts there? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes. Um, <clears throat> there's a process um, when you get your building permit, it's called the construction control process. When we apply for that building permit, um, my firm as the engineer of record signs an affidavit that says we will be responsible for um, providing routine inspections of the construction. Uh, providing reports to building inspectors that of those routine inspections and it's a requirement uh, for us to provide a final construction control affidavit in order to apply for the building permit to be closed out okay. so there's already kind of a mechanism in place for inspections and close out through the building department and, and that includes confirming that the construction was in substantial conformance with the, the design plans Okay. And it, it goes beyond that to further detail, is including inspection of the foundation and the rebar and the, uh, you know, that level of detail that the building inspector will also do. To, to the issues raised by the applicant uh, and uh, his engineer, I think that does make sense to come from the building inspector or building commissioner. I mean, that so, could be filed uh, with, with the planning board. So the regulation in our bylaw states, the building inspector will not grant an occupancy permit. This is, this is out in the um, power bylaw. 
will not grant an occupancy permit until he and the planning board receive a construction control certification that is stamped by a professional engineer licensed in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This certifies that the communication facility was built in accordance with the planning board approved construction plans and specifications as contained in the application and the special permit conditions, if any, granted by the planning board. And it said that's one. And then after that, it says the construction is completed. After the construction is completed, the town building inspector and planning board will inspect the site to verify that requirements of this article have been met. So, so that's, I think that's, that's pretty good summation of what so that, that, that's, what, that's what Tom just said. The only difference is, is that we've got to give a copy of that construction control affidavit to the planning board. But um, and and um, do you guys want to go out and visit the site? You can anytime you want. But there's there's not a mechanism for a sign off as there is with the building permit under Mass Law. And if I could add just one more thought, and it might be too too. It might cover be under this line item, but another 12. There's also one more permit we have to get. It's called the NIPTES permit, and that's due to the amount of land disturbance. Uh, due to the amount of land disturbance, um, and that's administered through the EPA, but that also has a, a requirement for inspections of erosion control, and it, it spells out exactly who, what, where, and when needs to perform those inspections and um, complete any um, any maintenance along the way. So it's, it's a pretty detailed permit that's that's also in place. That I know that may hit further down, but there's another mechanism for which, because we're over an acre of disturbance, we need to uh, be part of as well. And, and, and potentially in a similar way, the board could uh, require a, a copy of the NIPTES NPDES uh, uh, sign off uh, to just confirm that erosion control is handled So, um, I think what we've talked about is that there there is a mechanism that we're supposed to follow here. Perhaps we're not describing it accurately as it currently is. Um, but, Mr. Murray? So, this is directly equatable to the solar fields right. certificate to generate. Correct. And what the history in this town has been is that the building inspector has not followed the rules and issues an occupancy certificate because the electrical inspector and he have reviewed everything and those components are complete. But the planning board components are not complete. And the reason the planning board has a certificate to generate it on the solar fields is because once they start generating, we lose all ability to enforce anything. Correct. And even the building inspector becomes essentially powerless because it takes forever for somebody to do what they're supposed to be doing. And we found that on more than one of these solar fields. So if we don't want to call it a certificate to complete, we want to say pursuant to the requirements of section 18 close out, the planning board must, through their agent or through the board, sign off that the project is complete prior to the issuance of an occupancy permit or, you know, transmission receipt. I, 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 just to add one further last comment here, that part of the initial um, application for a building permit includes a um, a, right a, a, a stamped affidavit from, from the engineering firm that says they will be responsible for completing those inspections. Um, so we basically, once the building permit is issued, are on the hook to make sure that we follow through on it. So there is, there is some, uh, there is some out of the gate requirement for us to be kind of diligent in inspection. We understand yeah. that the, the control of construction, I do public sector work all the time, but that doesn't equate to all components of the special permit being adhered to. Once you start transmitting, receiving, and making money, the town has almost no 
ability without involving town council to finalize and close out the project. So that's that's where this is coming from, and yeah, yeah it is in. Yeah, it's in E. Yeah, and it's I in e, so I, I'll point this out, and that this was actually put in as an amendment in 2018, way after the fact that when when the when the uh, when when Article 18 was actually included, and I think it was actually added as a result of problems that we saw in other sectors where special permits have been uh, put in. If your concern, quite frankly, is only that you have to come back and get this here, I think that's a very low bar to jump over, considering what we are asking for overall here. All, all I would ask is that you defer to the zoning ordinance, because that talks about an occupancy permit, which is a document that um, is issued in connection with a building permit sign-off. Um, this language here invents another document that doesn't exist. I, I, I'm fully, fully agreement on this here, but I think what we need to incorporate into this particular section is section 18.6.2c, the wording that provides the protection that the town needs, and that is, is to get the building inspector to only grant the occupancy permit upon meeting the criteria under sections, subsections one, two, and three underneath that. I, 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 I agree with all that. We My should concern say is section 18, or yeah. article 18, yeah. section one through. So, so just to, to and remove the phrase certificate to. Yeah, yeah to cut this off, because I think we're all in agreement yeah. when we're talking around circles. And, and the only thing I, I don't understand is the building inspector has a role. The planning board has a different role. If we say we want to do an inspection, is that a, a public hearing that has to be noticed? Is it, so, you know, there's, there's just so many questions that come up when the planning board has decision making authority. Because do they have to do it at a public hearing? Do they have to do it, administ can they do it administratively? Can one board do it, or, or one board member? So, uh, you know, th there's just so many issues with getting the planning board involved as opposed to just the building inspector who's um, got statutory and state code authority to, to deal with these things. To, uh, to Bill's uh, earlier point, because I, I think it kind of it flew by in, in everything that was going on, we had historically had issues with uh, our building commissioner and zoning enforcement officer. It's been a challenge for the town to effectively provide those services over the years. So we've moved into situation where we're now going to have somebody who is full-time that we believe will vigorously follow the rules and enforce our zoning bylaws. Um, it's, it's been related to me by the select board that, that we can expect that the new person to be that kind of uh, person, which I think would be fantastic. Um, but, but the why is, that's the why. Um, and, and that was why we, where we're coming from and why we feel the way that we do. So in terms of moving this forward, what what are we looking at for language there? Is there a recommendation? I've got one. Else? So if we were to say, so section two says, after construction is completed, the town inspector, building inspector, and the planning board will inspect the site to verify that requirements in the article were met. And then Article 3, underneath that says, an occupancy permit will be issued if and when both the building inspector and planning board agree that all requirements in this article have been met. So what we could do is we could write a, co um, a copy of this decision shall be maintained at the site at all times until a final inspection, until final inspection and approval of the site as, as required. The final inspection and approval of the site is complete, I guess, as required by Section 18.6.2.C, 3 and 4. Therefore, you don't get your, your occupancy permit does it, but there has to be some input from the planning board. Um, I mean, it's in the bylaw. Right? I, I so. understand that. I just think there's a practical reality. Um, I agree with it. It's in the bylaw. I didn't ask for a variance. Um, um, it's hard enough getting the building inspector to do a site inspection. Um, and um, you guys all work during business hours. So if you want to take time off, 
on the building permit schedule and on Tom's schedule to uh, building inspector schedule to do a site inspection. I guess that's what we'll have to do. Great. Well, it can't be done on Saturdays. It can't be done at night. Uh, it has to be done when the building inspector works. So I just think you're just creating issues for yourself in the future. That and mm -hmm. well, the well, the board could subsequently waive that down the road if it turned out to not be feasible. Is that correct, Council? Mm -hmm. or I mean, there wasn't a waiver requested, right? I mean, it's a condition. Um, you'd have to probably at least get a modification. Uh, of the decision? Of the decision. Yeah. We're trying to work that, within the framework. In, that, um, that inspection could also be in the form of a uh, review of a uh, construction complete uh, report. It's usually a 50-page report with photographs that document how the site has been constructed and is in conformance. So it may be that uh, receiving and reviewing that report um, is also meeting the, the, you know, your, your concern. So I direct this question towards council. Given our procedural history on this, uh, do you think we can really say anything here other than a copy of this decision shall be maintained at the site at all times? until a final inspection and approval of site pursuant to and then cite the section. Right. I mean, really what the, what, really what the condition is, I mean, it's already a condition in the bylaw, right? So really the only difference is that you're saying that copies should be kept there until the, this happens. Yeah. So, so just incorporating this into here doesn't change anything other than having to keep a decision there, a copy of the decision there. That's a good point. I'll accept that. Uh, the bylaw exists. We're just we're with that clause. We're just saying I, unless that's in here too. I don't. I well, this doesn't. This, that would take out the the completion certificate out of it. Right. That's what I'm saying. saying right. Right. Yes. Yeah. But it's thoroughly addressed in the bylaw. Right. 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 That it has to be the planning board too. Yeah. yeah. I think the problem is that we're. This is the first cell tower. I don't think our building inspectors know much about cell towers. Right, so it's kind of a second check on does it I, all well, comply? No, they'll be relying on the construction control affidavit yeah. by the PEs. That's but good. maybe you say by the planning board or their agent. Well, I, I think all we can say is pursuant I, to I the would bylaw. Just, I, would I just think say agents implied yeah, in but this. We're, yeah. we're limited by what the bylaw is. I would leave it at that. Okay. So uh, let's, I, I didn't expect that one to go to so well, a, believe me, we've got lots of issues. There, there's a lot of similar <laughs> issues in all of this. this yeah. is the, we're getting into the hard parts now. Yeah. So let's move on to the next one. The applicant shall provide and record at the Registry of Deeds with this decision permission from the current landowner granting the town of Hubbardston or its agent agents to enter the property for the purposes of decommissioning, removing the installation pursuant to... I think that other is not necessary. Pursuant to the zoning bylaws. The only change I would make is prior to the issuance of a building permit. The, uh, I agree with it conceptually. Logistically, that's a challenge. And um, because I've got three different landowners, and in addition, um, the form of agreement that we've used is a tri party agreement with the town. So I got to get the town to sign off on it. Probably the Board of Selectmen have to agree to it and authorize the Board of the Town Administrator to sign it. and. Uh, I have a form here that, uh, quite frankly, another town uh, generated, and I thought it was pretty good, and it, it accomplishes what you're trying to accomplish. So I think we can come to terms on the form of agreement, just not before the decision. But we still have plenty of time between now and the issuance of a building permit uh, to do this. So uh, it, it's just a logistical issue. Right. Uh, suggestions from the board or council? This is still on four, right? No, we're on five. And I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, me yeah, too. The, the numbers have changed. but uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, the numbers have stayed the same. Because we're talking about the because application added, shall provide the record two. of the Register of Deeds. Yes. <clears throat> with this decision, permissions from the current and landowner granting the town of Hubberson or its agents to enter the property for the purpose of decommissioning, removing the installation person to the zoning. Right, and, that, and that's what I'm commenting on. The, just the, the agreement of the landowners and which also requires the agreement of the town to go on the property uh, 
So it's a tri-party agreement. I, like I said, I have a form here. I started working on it today, but it's not going to get resolved today because town council has to review it. Uh, uh, the town has to sign it. So there's just so all I'm saying is saying, not um, um, when it says the applicant shall provide and record at this the register of deeds um, instead of the words with this decision say prior to the issuance of a building permit. Oh, I see. It's just a timing thing. I think that's reasonable. How's yep. the board? Yeah. I'm fine with it. I, 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 so number six, the special permit shall lapse two years from the issue in state if substantial use has not commenced except for good cause. Yep. Prior to the commencement of any site work, the applicant owner shall submit written confirmation from the tax Can we go collector. Back to six. Yes. This permit, not the special permit, but this permit. Yes. Agreed. So seven, uh, prior to the commencement of any site work, the applicant owner shall submit written confirmation from the tax collector that all taxes, including any rollback taxes, have been paid in full for all property included in this application. Uh, and I would again change that to prior to the issuance of a building permit, which is a more defined term yep. uh, and better for the town. I, we agree with it. Just So prior to, we want to scratch out issuance of a building permit, the applicant owner? Yep. Yes. Questions, comments from the board, council? No, I agree. It's, it makes more sense. Uh, number eight, prior to the commencement of any site work, the applicant owner shall pay all outstanding fees incurred to the planning board's consultants, including town council of the professional services required by the board to review and approve the project. Again, prior additions for a building permit. Instead of the commencement of any site work? Yep. I'm thinking you're going to have exactly the same wording for number nine, right? No, we haven't finished with seven yet or eight yet. Um, um, the issuance, the comment is I can't agree to pay what I don't know. So um, um, I, if you give me a list of fees tonight, we can incorporate that into the decision, and I can agree to pay it, but I can't agree to open end it. Uh, so uh, I don't know what else the boards requires, but it's got to be finite, and it's got to be defined. Let's address the devil. And that is, is at this point in time we have <coughs> included in the top of page eleven and an, an estimate of not to exceed. Are there any other fees due? There could potentially be. Can um, we <coughs> list them? Somebody's got to review that tri-party agreement. Council, do you have any, any comments on this? No, I, in terms of the, what the number would be. Uh, not, not in terms of the number, but in terms of the applicant's obligation to pay for either. Um, I mean, you know, the board can put a condition in, and if it comes to the point that that condition is, that the applicant is not satisfied with that condition, then the applicant can appeal. Um, it's really the best you can do if you don't have the number. I, I assume that's also in the bylaw, right? No. Uh, it's Mr. in the Murray. statute. In the statute, yeah. yeah. Mr. Murray? It, this is a boilerplate that we put in almost every permit that we assist in the drafting of, and we do it for five separate towns. This, the, the, it's boilerplate. It's, yeah, I mean, it's certainly usually what you see. Sometimes you do see a more c concrete number. But um, 
and this is generally the way it's done. So the <coughs> I mean, we, we've had a continuing issue with this, uh, and like I said, we'll agree to all reasonable fees. Uh, I'll even go on record and say the fee proposed tonight was reasonable, and we will agree to pay that. Uh, however, um, uh, uh, the I, I, well, do you agree that a tripartite agreement that has to be reviewed by the attorneys is certainly a fee that will be incurred, but you cannot necessarily know what that piece could be at this point in time but if we're limiting it to that that's fine unfortunately um, we still have four more pages where there are just more and more fees more and more inspections more and more um, discretion and more and more uh, planning okay, board so then approval. let's go through this here yeah. and come back to this particular let's park this here yeah. and and at some point in time we'll have to come back to number eight right okay let's talk about number eight because it's the same issue the applicant shall fund an account. Uh, the cost of the services, uh, uh, you know, uh, what? Do, uh, uh, th these are all issues that the building per building inspector is supposed to do as part of the. I, I don't agree with that. Um, I don't agree with that at all. Certainly, the conservation commission in a town, or the erosion control inspector in a town, or the stormwater inspector in a town. All of these are positions, the planning agent in a town. All of these are agents of individual boards, and they're all responsible under various statutes and regulations and zoning bylaws for inspecting in addition to the requirements of the building inspector. The building inspector is not an erosion control expert. He doesn't know wetlands. He doesn't know stormwater and all those I, kind of I things. Might, um, I might offer that there is some redundancy there that that's maybe what I was talking about a little too early, but was the NIPTES permit whereby um, there is uh, a responsible authority for uh, reviewing and inspecting the erosion controls on site. So it may be a, a bit redundant to um, suggest that a, a, the applicant needs to fund an additional um, inspection of those same things um, in, in, in each one of these items. The site clearing, um, each one of these items, and then plus significantly more than that. Um, and that, and that is, uh, uh, that's overseen by a professional engineer and signed off uh, by a professional engineer. So. No, that's not true. It doesn't need to be overseen by a professional engineer, nor does it have to be signed off by a professional engineer. Uh, the the NIPTES uh, permit I'm, has... I'm, I'm talking about two separate things for the inspection. There is uh, the construction control, uh, most definitely is signed off by a professional <coughs> engineer. The NIPTES permit is, uh, it goes under the contractor's name and specifies what the contractor needs to keep an eye on. But it, as the part of the process that Vertex undertakes, they hired my firm, who is overseen by a professional engineer, to be on site and to inspect erosion controls throughout the process. So I don't think that it's a, my, my point is uh, to require an additional inspection of the same thing is redundant. And it happens in every town, everywhere across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, all the time. Uh, You're um, absolutely right. With an engineer that we retain, that we, um, that we pay for, that we um, have, use his license to certify it. We don't have it redundant and have the town also engage somebody to review it. But we, we've, we've built dozens, if not hundreds of these facilities. And um, this never comes up because the town uses its own building inspector to conduct inspections and to, um, con uh, and to rely on our engineers to provide a construction control affidavit. We've where, it, where it might, um, where it might come in in other towns is if there is a conservation permit required and if the town has a conservation agent. But in this case, we don't need a conservation permit. We are not that close to the uh, wetlands. Um, but there's a, there's an additional process through conservation typically. But that's, that's not the case in this case. Okay, well, in so, my 30 years of doing public sector work and working for multiple municipalities across the town as their agent, this is far from an unusual requirement for the town to do belt and suspenders. It's a very, very, very common thing for towns to have individual agents who are knowledgeable in subject matter 
to look at a site by means of example we have a project under construction in this town I was able to respond within a day to a complaint that was made and we were able to respond it almost immediately it cost the property owner one hour of my time and we resolved a, a noise and working out of time complaint and erosion control complaint. So I, I think that this is nickel and diming on the applicant's part, and I'll be quiet on that. Uh, if you want to put a not to exceed number, we'll agree to it. Uh, uh, but that's the point. It's like, uh, you know, there, there's all these costs that we don't incur. And, and I understand part of the problem is that you don't have a competent building inspector. But you're working towards that. It's one of your requirements under Mass Law to have one, or to sub it out to somebody else, like the uh, Worcester County. But uh, um, we we do not deal with anybody but building inspectors. After 99.999 percent of the time, we never deal with planning boards. We never deal with fees after the building permit, after the planning board approval is over. So I I want to be done tonight, uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, and I hand this over to a contractor who pulls a building permit, who engages Tom to uh, 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 supervise the construction in accordance with Mass Law. And we do this all the time. Suggestions from the council or the board? You know, I'm running out of steam. I think we're going to have to adjourn this. I just, I think there's not goodwill at this point to get it resolved. And we put in hours and hours and hours. So is, is there? I, I, I'm going to leave it 11, I think. I, I mean, it's you know, just I, too I'm late. Gonna, I'm, I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to agree with you. Uh, we're moving in the right direction. I completely agree. So you agree we should come back? Yeah. I mean, reasonably. Uh, not a month from now, but uh, uh, we're moving in the right direction. You're willing to sign an agreement to do that? Um, so you don't yell at us for shot clocks and miss nope, this and nope, that? We're, we're certain, no, absolutely not. I will sign an agreement and giving you a reasonable extension. Absolutely. Uh, one, one of the issues that I have is the zoning board. Um, and we have We're some well, we have some deadlines with respect to that. I would hope that this gets wrapped up before the deadlines for the zoning board uh, um, because you still have to What vote. are your deadlines for the zoning board? Um, September 20th. Yeah, I just... So, uh, if you and we, if we could say, if you guys could put your heads together and say, okay, there's four reviews and they're each going to cost no more than 300 bucks. So I'm going to put 1,200 bucks in the account. If there's any left over, you'll get it back, or 2,500, or whatever it is. But we can't. I mean, it's unreasonable. What you're requesting of us is unreasonable. I think is that in terms of time and. You know, we, we have tried to accommodate this. Uh, uh, to, to be honest, I'm not asking you to do anything. That's, I'm trying to get the planning board out of this. Uh, but uh, you don't recognize that this is our job and this is how we do things so, in this town, so. And I'm hopeful that you hire a competent building inspector that offloads all of these responsibilities. Well, so that's not our responsibility. Not, and we the don't responsibility hire, of the town, we do understand it. But we also, have to protect, we also have to protect the interests of the town. And with the past experience, that's exactly what we're doing. And the bylaws do reflect that. And so as a result of that, you also have to understand you want to do business in this town. And from our perspective, we're trying to make sure that the town is protected. Uh, yes, we come with a hindrance. We're a very, very small town with a very, very limited budget. And uh, I'm, I'm asking for a certain, we're asking for a certain flexibility yeah. also on your side. And I think that the term of Nickel and diming is getting to the point where, yeah, I know we're talking about potentially hundreds or maybe thousands of dollars, but in the context of the overall, overall project, I want you to be very reasonable in terms of uh, also working with us to come to some form of a normal agreement so that we are not extending. This is costing us money, that's costing us money, and quite frankly, I do not see us for the next meeting having to subsidize this a second time, because the yeah. townspeople should not be subsidizing this here. Okay. I I echo that, that sentiment. Um, I think it's pretty apparent based upon the, the work that we've done leading up to this meeting and our commitment to work through this tonight that we are making every effort possible to be reasonable. And I know that uh, I, I have lost a tremendous amount of time to this. Yeah. I know Francois and Alice have lost a tremendous amount of time to this. We've had significant council fees. Um, 
we need to be able to move on both sides to reach a compromise here. So I think to the point that, yeah, there probably has to be some not to exceed number, and I don't think we're going to find that number right now, but I think we all need to commit to that and move forward because I'm sure you can hear it in all of our voices. Our patience is running out yep. uh, completely because I don't, I don't think there's any harder we could work on this. Um, I don't think there's anything to add to that, frankly. I mean, so I, I'm looking. I'm looking at the agreement that we have here. I'm looking for words like pay, fund, etc. I, I don't. I don't see how many. How many more there are? If you can cite for us, and I'm asking you to do it right now, because it is way past our time. If you can cite the areas that are your concern, bring those to the attention of the chair, so that we can potentially address these here beforehand. That will be greatly appreciated from our end. Yeah. Okay. Specifically so, a list. So we need to continue the hearing. The hearing has to be continued, but it has to be at this point in time. I think it has to be accepted by okay. both parties, correct? Well. Are we still under the timeline? I, w will you so, agree to toll everything, at least until the next meeting? Um, I mean, you have, you're going to have to agree to that. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I don't, the only thing that I think is running is the, um, uh, the shot clock. And there's a disagreements with respect to date, and I think um, Catherine was the one that said we're not up against it yet. I disagree with her. We will agree to toll that. I don't think toll there's any statutory yeah, exactly. And, it's, and I'm assuming that we're doing this reasonably, not a month from now. Yeah, no, I, I would. Uh, I. I mean, you got to do it to date certain. So let's talk about date certain now. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Murray. So just a quick question. <coughs> By tolling, you mean you're extending the time in which the board has to act. But you, usually what happens in communities is the next meeting will work out the rest of these changes. It's going to take a couple, three days to actually get the changes made and get the endorsement of the board and all that kind of stuff. So in towns where we request an extension, we request an extension to the time for the planning board to hold the public hearing but also extend a week beyond that to grant the board time to prepare the documents and file them with the town clerk. So because otherwise you're going to be filing with no, the town I, clerk no, next I, I agree with that. Thursday night. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. It, it, the, the shot clock works a little differently, but yes, can we do to the next meeting plus 14 days? Um, yes. So we're extending, right? right. Extending. I say tolling, meaning it's almost like that time doesn't count. That's right? correct. So we're yep. extending from tonight to the next meeting plus 14 days. To file the decision. To mm -hmm. file the decision. Now, do we need a written agreement for that? Like, yes. what if it was the 90 days? And it needs days? to go to the town clerk. Yeah, it needs to go to the town clerk. Uh -huh. I mean, he said it Can on the record. Can be in writing. I mean, just you, you, in you'll, you will have my word when we walk out of here. I'll send you a formal agreement in the morning. Uh, that the issue is not um, the concept. It's the date that we're extending tonight. I think we we'll should have it in writing tonight. Uh, yeah, let's you can confirm writing. it with the letter. Right, yeah. uh, can, I, can I ask somebody to uh, to draft that? And I guess let's talk dates. So our our next scheduled meeting would be the third Thursday of this month. This would be the. Second. Which I think actually comes up pretty quick because Today this is, is a Wednesday. weird shaped month. Are we talking Thursday or Wednesday? Uh, third Thursday. We're first Wednesday, third Thursday. So the 22nd. Uh, I think the third Thursday is actually the 15th because uh, it's a. Oh, you're right. You're right. The, the 15th. So it's next week on the 15th. I have some. I am, I'm not going to be here. I can't make that. Sorry. Uh, what have, about. I, I, I'm going to be out of town. What about the 22nd? Because that that provides two weeks to get the stuff worked out instead of forcing it into uh, what functionally turns into six days. Uh, anyway, we could do Wednesday instead of Thursday. Um, you talking about the fourteenth or the twenty first? Twenty first. Twenty first would work. Or, or the fourteenth. I just I just have a conflict. Mm -hmm. I, I'll get He's out. asking. Is there Is anybody? No, I, I can't do the fourteenth. If if I could do the twenty first. Um, I think on the 20, can can somebody check and see if there's any other town meeting scheduled for that night to make sure we're not looting 
Let me double check you. Let's see if there's anything at this point in time. Are you the 21st or the 22nd? Wednesday, the 21st. The, the 21st, because there's meetings that fall on Wednesdays, which is yeah. why. Are we at Wednesday right now? Uh, yeah, but we claim this. So the 14th. This is also our first time holding it first Wednesday. Our regional planning authority meets first Thursday. Yeah, so the, we had to the, the 14th is, I mean, I, I'll just see, it's the Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts Joint Transfer, the MJs, and that's at 2.30. Well, I think we're looking no. at the Next 21st one, of the, the 21st, 22nd. there is nothing right now uh, during the normal, yep, the so evening is open. So it's September 21st, which is a what? It's uh, September 21st is a Wednesday. Yeah, I could, I could make that work. Okay, so uh, I think we'll, we'll be we need to pencil this in and make sure that nobody takes this time. Yeah, I think we'll be uh, unintentionally bumping into the DC meeting, but um, I think we have to do what we have to do here. Um, the only issue is <coughs> um, we probably have to file an appeal of the zoning board prior to first on the 20th um, well we can still try to hammer away tonight but we can't no, just no we're done no, I yeah. completely yeah. agree we're all tired and great I, it's not the uh, uh, make it the 21st okay so we're extending then it would be 28 days 14 right 14 and 14 um, it would be the first. 28th plus 14 oh 28th or I'm sorry the 21st plus 14th so whatever that is. The yeah, but we're, we're extending the final deadlines 28 days. <coughs> so from from the 21st? No. No. 14 days. Oh, 14 20 days. 20 20 14 days from the 21st. But that's not, you're not up against the shot clock necessarily yet. What we're saying is we're adding 28 days to whatever that deadlines are right now to incorporate the next meeting and 14 days after that. I think, I think she's catching it. Just so that everyone understands about the shot clock, the shot clock allows me to assume a negative decision and allows me to go into federal court and say, you took too much time. Um, I'm not gonna do that as a practical reality as long as we're moving towards a positive decision. We've made great progress tonight. I'm immensely appreciative of that. Whoever drafted this spent an immense amount of time and we're very appreciative of that. We're moving in the right direction. So there's no need for me to run into federal court at this point. That just, uh, 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 yeah, I think uh, ultimately the concern for us is the 90 day window from the hearing, and I don't believe. Well, well, we'll it, it it's it. actually it's actually the close of the public hearing. Right. So as Which long as you're acting reasonably, uh -huh. if you were to kick this out a month, I'd have a complaint. If you kicked it out two weeks, you're being more reasonable. Are you saying that the public hearing, which we close today, that that's the that's the timeline? So we close the public hearing today, right? No. No, we only we close the public, public, public comments. comments. Public we will comments. have the public sorry, the pu back here sorry, next the public, time. Okay. And we'll the sit through comments. their comments it's again. It's still a public hearing. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So, okay. so to, to Mr. Parisi's point, yeah, it's from the close of the hearing, but there's case law that says that if you're dragging your feet and you're not cooperating as a planning board, that it, which is not the case, board, right. that, that that can be interpreted differently. Make it just so all. Uh, ultimately, the reason we do that is 20 days. to cover from that. But, um, Would you agree, Mr. Parisi, to at least send an extensions. email I'm sorry. or a letter to the, the board the stating the fact that the hearing we're going to have a written agreement tonight? It's right there. Okay. 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 And, and not only that, but All that, that you see that there's progress actually being made. Yeah. Okay. I, I completely agree. Because we're going because it might extend after. Okay. Oh, but this, and this is a 14, so the 14 days doesn't cover it. No. I oh, think you're asking for 14 days after the 21st. No, no. It is late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Working Main Street into the Wednesday like plan. Beyond even the town ground. <laughs> All October already. Deadlines. <laughs> they used to have their meetings. Yeah. Extended. 28 total days. I find this more exciting on TV. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the 21st. Well, on, on, on TV, you can watch it with a beer. All that's on the last one. Can we get. Um, you might want to write it. My hand is literally unreadable. 
Um, Should be the doctor. <laughs> no, no, it's re it's quite legible. So this okay. says the planning board in Vertex Towers LLC hereby agrees agree to extend the hearing on the South Tower proposal for 14 Main Street until Wednesday, February to Wednesday, September 21st, 2022. All deadlines to be extended 28 days from today. No, 28 days from otherwise um, from what the deadline otherwise would be. Um, All right, that's what we're saying. We're, we're pausing basically for 28 days. No, that's not true because under you have 14 days to issue the written decision after the 14 after the next meeting. So I'm not extending that out 28 days. I'm just extending um, the. I'm, not, I'm really not extending anything. I understand, but you're agreeing to extend to to the next meeting. Right, I, I'm agree, but not like that second clause, because then you could say I'm extending the decision date for another 28 days, and I'm not. I'm okay. just extending. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, so, uh, 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 okay. I, I see think we're all saying the same thing. Yeah, saying it. Okay. I just, I, I'm, all, I'm reluctant to write something quickly, and I will be, I will perhaps, I have forms that we do this all the time. I, know, I understand. I just can't do it right now. Well, it's, but it's I think open um, session. What, the, the goal is to. Um, but the rule finish, is finish deliberations and vote on September 21. But my understanding of law is that if you're up against this, these deadlines, if you do not have an extension in writing before you leave I the think meeting, it should be in writing. and you've threatened us with all kinds of deadlines, so I think it has to be in writing tonight. It can't be that you'll send us a letter tomorrow. So if you want to take a stab writing no, it. So I, so I think that the, the, the date by which the, the planning board must vote on the proposed application shall be extended to September 20. But I'm not even sure it's to that it's that date yet. See, that's the problem. So I, I think no, that's before the time that the shot clock's even up. Right. I, I, I mean, um, so uh, the, like I said, but the shot clock is I know irrelevant. Well, but I, I, I'm not going to run into federal that, court if I'm going to get a positive decision on the September 21st. I understand. Uh, 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 I'll take my chances that you guys are acting in good faith because I know you are. Um, the date by which the board must vote on the um, on the application shall be extended till September 21. But that's bef what? That, that's before either. Right. Oh, so the date. Okay. So uh, I may I maintain the shot clock. It's expired. Captain maintains the shot clock hasn't expired. But if it hasn't expired, then right, we don't need to vote. extend anything. Exactly. So so if we're so we don't I don't need to sign anything. So I don't want to sign anything that extends something that I uh, that that I don't have to. So all I'm extending is the date by which the board needs to vote to make a decision. We're not extending that. We'll extend this hearing to the next to from 14 days from today. Right, exactly. But so that that goes to my point. If we're not if we're not concerned about the shot clock and we're all reasonably twenty first that we're, we're within ninety days uh, of the hearing for constructive grant, isn't that what we're ultimately? I, I don't about? think so. Uh, I don't think I have a claim for a constructive grant against the planning board like I did against his own way. It's two different statutes. Yes. Two different explanations. So you accepted the filing May 26th. That started the clock. I I maintain I filed it on April 4th. But uh, again, yeah. But our bylaws are pretty explicit. They say you shall submit at a planning board hearing, and they shall accept your filing, and then accept your filing until that date. The uh, the statute uh, counts the 90 days from the date of the hearing. Exactly. Uh, not the the application date doesn't have an impact on it. For the planning, so board. You for, the plan, for the planning board, That's completely right. different situation for the ZBA, but for the planning board. Um, so it's the day of the hearing, which we just went through, was July. 7th. Which is also arguably today, because the hearing's been continued and not ended. Agreed. What's your date on the shot clock? Do you have a date? Um, would you claim the shot clock? I would maintain that it was August fourth. I mean, sorry, April fourth. Plus 150 days, which I believe was September 1st, uh, and um, and we so extended. Why, why, yeah, why can't we just let, well, let's just extend the meeting to, to the next 
open meeting on um, the special permit application to September 21st. That's correct. Doesn't that That's solve everything? Said. That's said. Yeah, but and leave open when a decision needs to be made because that's dependent on when the open meeting is closed for the special permit. They're not going to have a decision in 14 days necessarily on the special permit. They have to. Uh, you have to have a written decision within 14 days of the decision of the uh, was of the, the, the vote. Right, the vote. Yeah, yeah that, that, right. I guess that's what it's I'm saying. You're sort of assuming 20. we're going to vote next week. Is, exactly. is the issue. Right, we're almost there too. All right. So I suppose we could extend it again if for some reason we don't vote next week. Correct. Okay. So I think that's. So if we're right. So if, if you're going to vote on this on September 21st, then the then the timeline starts. We may not do that. But I think it's just extending the decision, uh, or just extending the hearing to that date solves that issue. I don't think you need to say anything else. But so I do think you should have it in writing, just extending the. the so if we're, we have the crossed out. We have a simple, yeah. simple, simple sentence that says, the Hubbison Planning Board at Vertex Towers That's LLC it. hereby agrees to extend the hearing on the South Tower proposal of 14 Main Street until Wednesday, September 21st, Period. 2022. Don't we need a time, date, place, certain? September twenty-first at six thirty. Yeah. yeah, you can put this. You can put the address in. Next six thirty. Yeah. It's late, doesn't it? I gotta say, I'm so happy that bankruptcy court never happened at eleven o'clock at night. I don't know how you do. Um, <laughs> no. All right. That's so. It is we need to actually oh. do the document that we need. Document that we need to extend. Motion to continue. To continue. And then we'll need to close. Have a motion to adjourn. And somebody needs to get that to the town clerk. Well, she's available tomorrow, right? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Get the chair. It's yes. Wednesday, so yes. If we're meeting. Oh, I guess you have a date on the top. What is today's date? September 27th. Yeah, I'm going to shoot a copy and put it in her box and then hold the paper copy of the person and bring it over. Um, I may need to make a motion to adjourn the hearing until September 21st at 6 30. Continue, you mean? Continue. Continue. I'm seconding that motion. Oh. All right, hearing, uh, hearing motion and a second, and I need to sign this too, correct? Yeah, just sign. Uh, any discussion? Uh, hearing no discussion, let's have a roll call vote. Steiger, aye. McDonough, aye. Eric Dack, aye. Amelia, aye. Monroe, aye. Um, the, uh, the public hearing is continued. Um, I just said a matter of formality. You are going to get to us a list of what you deem to be the yes. issues from a funding perspective. You will itemize those for us. Please present those to the chair. Yep. Please, so that we can have those. Please also copy the plan at Hubbardston because, uh, uh, Nancy is starting up and we're going to get her ready to help manage the all right, so that is continued. So let's forego everything else that might have been on the agenda. Do <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to continue? <laughs> uh, uh, would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn? I'm making a motion to adjourn. I will second. Uh, right. Hearing uh, a motion and a second, non debatable. Uh, let's have a, a vote. Steiner, aye. Lugo, aye. Eric, aye. Amelia, aye. Uh, Monroe, I. Uh, thank you well, much. thank you all so much for uh, for sticking it out. Uh, I'm happy we're getting some 